It is now nine o'clock. Welcome to everybody. I want to say again, thank you to Mark Hart for once again being my ultimate co-host, tech guru extraordinaire, and the guy that's actually putting all this stuff available and, and documenting it and uh, cataloging it on the OC Callers website for us. Um, can't believe it's been four years uh, since we actually started this, three years since we started recording in 2020. Uh, that's a lot of material out there. <laughs> Today's session being the first one to kick off of the new year, I thought I would go back, and this is more of a, a lecture type presentation, but talk about all the things that we've talked about and more or less set a kind of agenda template of what we're going to be looking at this year. Once again, I am looking for topics and uh, callers that wish to give a presentation. If you have something to say that you think is of value added, by all means, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a brand new caller, if you've been calling for 50, 60, 70 years, your experiences, your knowledge is worth listening to because everybody will learn something from everybody else. As you may note, we've just had a almost 40 minute discussion on the movement swing through, or not swing through, swing. There's always things to look at and people are coming uh, to develop from everybody else's experiences. Over the last three years of the Ash Caller training series, we've had uh, a lot of presenters, a lot of discussion in detail about the individual fundamentals of what many perceive as optimal square dance calling. Uh, and as we noted, optimal is not about being the best caller in the world or the best singer or the best choreographer or anything like that. It's about being the best you that you can be, whether you're a brand new caller, a journeyman caller, a tradesman like me, or a world renowned international headline caller. There's always time and necessity to review the fundamentals to be a better you than you are now. And what this session is, is a synopsis review of those fundamental aspects of calling that we've been discussing over the last few years uh, and are providing, they're going to be provided in a reference sheet point list for referral to assist in improving site calling, mental image, modular reading, and more importantly, evaluating your own or others written material. And it's only when you understand that you'll never be able to keep track of all aspects of calling at all times. It's impossible. And all callers will not only need, need but use calling aids, such as notes, memorized material, modules, techniques, et cetera, to allow them to focus on a more manageable number of items that are related to column at one time. You need these kinds of things. The beauty of it is, that with experience, more and more of this becomes second nature. And while you'll still use them, it's no longer gonna seem like you are using them and you come to rely on them less and less as you become more confident in your own abilities. And that is what we call the point of progression as a caller. Nobody remembers everything, but you remember more every time you do it. Um, before I begin, I've, I've got to acknowledge, and there's so many to, Acknowledge, but there's many callers that have had a big influence on my learning, but in particular, Ken Rattusi, Paul Adams, Kim Lindner, who I started with, Tony Oxendine, Dave Prescott, Al Stevens, Rich Reel, and many, many, many more. But all of these people who have articles, insights on choreography and square dance calling are foundational to caller development around the world. And I'm sure each and every one of you has your own list of people that have influenced you to make you a better caller. Uh, I will acknowledge Rich Reel in particular because much of this session, in fact, most of this session is based and collated on fundamental aspects of calling that he has developed in numerous articles over the many, many years that he's been doing this. We're going to start with choreographic flow. Many callers have widely different views on what constitutes good choreographic flow. And while many consider the following points, uh, they can either agree or disagree. Now, if you disagree, it doesn't mean you're wrong and it doesn't mean I'm right. It only means that you, as like me, have reasonable justification in your mind to disagree with a certain point of view. And you're going to find that, like callers, many dancers will agree or disagree with your point of view and others just won't care. They just want to get out there and dance. The best method of determination remains, however, to record yourself, dance to what you call, and give it a good, honest evaluation. So when talking about that, we talk in choreographic flow about smoothness. Smoothness is things like changes of body flow, making use of hands and arms to transfer momentum. And now you notice I said 
to transfer momentum. That means there has to be contact. There has to be a certain amount of physical give and flow. Okay? Things like an Alaman left, the hand con, it's good for sudden reverses of direction. The arm hold facilitates, like an Alaman left fundamentally is a sudden change of direction. But the arm hold, especially if you're doing it from a circle, getting that arm hold facilitates that tight turn and it counters that centrifugal force. Um, here in Australia, we do this handhold pigeon wing turn. It doesn't help. It's not as comfortable, but it has that same kind of pressure to counter that centrifugal force of it. Uh, in an ocean wave swing through, dancers reverse rotational direction, which is something we say, oh, don't do that, don't do that. But the arm contact and the hand contact transfers that momentum between the dancers that makes it comfortable. Movements like AC Ducey and Recycle, you've got sudden flow reversals for the centers, but they get that gentle nudge from the ends, that hand contact, just to break that resistance and create that counterflow that makes it work smoothly. Centers trade, bend the line. The centers move forward, but then they back up. Centers trade, bend the line. They forward, and then it's, it's almost a backing in. Why does that work? Because the end dancer is moving forward, and you've got that hand contact so that they can actually push off each other and make that work. The very controversial walk and dodge partner trade. The sudden reversal for the Dodger is, oh, so horrible. It's terrible for the ladies. It's terrible for the Dodgers. But you know what? It's not. Handhold transfers the momentum. And when you have dancers saying, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible, it's terrible, look at their hands. Chances are they're not finishing the walk touch. There's the handhold and the partner trade that comes with it. That actually flows quite nicely, but only if the handhold is there to transfer the momentum. Now, you may agree or disagree with those. That's not important. What, what is important is your dancers have to feel that smoothness in their dancing. It's very important to note that the good use of hand techniques facilitates good dancing. Poor hand techniques, particularly on the last three examples, AC, do see, recycle, centers trade and bend the line, or, partner, or walk and dodge partner trade, um, bad handholds are going to make those feel awkward and often uncomfortable. The reality is it's not always the movement mechanics, but the lack of dancing in the dance that facilitates awkward discomfort. Uh, timing of all three aspects is also important when you do that. And when I say all three timing aspects, that's lead time, command time, and execution time, they can subsequently affect and very substantially affect the smoothness by creating breaks or stops in the rushing flow that interfere with that. And that takes us into the next part, which is overflow. Each dancer should rarely be made to turn more than a full turn around a handhold in place. Okay, example, swing through centers trade. That's acceptable. Whereas in swing through centers cast three quarters is overflow. However, you've got to note that sometimes that overflow is built into a call and that, that overflow falls into the rare use aspect. For uh, example, it was given is in the advanced call motivate, um, this lead center will go one and a quarter turns around the center of the wave. That's built into the call, and it's usually followed by a direction change with a handhold to counteract that overflow. So sometimes it's built in, but it's not always there. It should not always be there, and it falls into that don't use this all the time, rare use. Um, excessive flow. Each dancer should very rarely accumulate more than two full turns clockwise or counterclockwise without reversing. Now, when I say two full turns, I'm including forward flowing movements. If you have movements like uh, swing through, now watch this dancer, uh, split circulate, boys run, pass through, boys run, uh, and AC Ducey, boys run, whatever, something like that. There's lots of flow across the center, but you're going like this, for the boy, around and around and around, even though there's long walks, that's excessive flow. Balanced flow. Each dancer wants to go to the left about as often as they go to the right. We as callers are not always doing that. We'll watch head couples and make sure that, the, oh yeah, the boy's not going, but we very rarely check the side, side man or the side lady, and sometimes they're going around in circles. Typical standard arrangements of choreography tend to have the boys going right and the girls going left. So it's important that you periodically counter that with girls going left, boy going right. 
sorry, I just said that wrong. You counter that with, uh, yeah, girl going right, boy going left, then that's better. Um, calls like Zoom and Cloverleaf, separate, centers in, cast off three quarters, all from standard arrangements are really, really good for creating that balance inflow. Using some calls in sachet arrangements also counter the trend of standard arrangements. However, you've got to be, use judgment here depending on the strength and experience of your dancers. Uh, I caution you, use non-standard arrangements very judiciously. You don't want to do it all the time, but you do want to do it periodically. Hand use, I talked briefly about that. Um, use the available hand. A hand just used for a pull by or an arm turn is not available generally for at least two beats. For example, square through, right and left through. Awkward, that hand is not available for the right hand again. However, in some movements, in the accepted uh, call scoot back, the same hand can often be used three times in a row considering the typical next call. It works because scoot back one takes time to do, it's a release and it's an extend that's built into the call. So it allows for that as part of the definition of the call and the dancers have been taught that. So there's an adjustment there. If you absolutely, which is rare due to the lack of available calls and poor caller judgment, but if you absolutely need to use a call that results in bad hand use, add a pause to break the flow. Um, this will most often happen at class level. Uh, when you're you're learning, for instance, from a double pass through, centers square through three, one, two, three, pause, star through. That's an absolute, but you can always break that up with square through three, slight pause, do si do, star through. You know, you you put a break in there. It allows just a little bit more flexibility and a little bit more smoothness for the dancers rather than that jarring, oh, I've got to change. Oh, no, I'm using the same hand. Ouch. Alternate hands when you can. Example, single hinge swing through is horrible. It's not as nice as cast off three quarters, centers trade. Similarly, from facing couples Dixie style to an ocean wave, left swing through. That gets called an awful lot. It's horrible because you're turning left and then you're turning left again but consider Dixie style to an ocean wave center start, swing through. That's good hand use. And there's lots of examples. Um, head square through, swing through, boys run, bend the line, reverse flutter wheel. That's a nice flow. Uh, from partner lines, past the ocean, swing through, spin the top, single hinge. Past the ocean, forward, right hand, left hand three, right hand, hinge, oh, beautiful flow. Left, right, left, right. Uh, from a double pass through with girls in the center. Girls swing through, turn through, star through. Right, left, right, left. Beautiful. You know, and, the, and everybody's got multiple sequences like that. The idea is to keep everyone moving and enjoy the dance. Okay. So you want to avoid having inactive dancers as much as you can. Um, most of our square dance calling, especially on singing calls, is geared to have active dancers and inactive dancers at the start of almost all the openings. Well, what's to stop us from saying, giving those inactive dancers something to do, you know? Heads, square through, come on, sides, clap hands, cheer them on, or just stand there and look pretty. Tell them to do nothing, but you're, you're interacting with them and you're giving them something to do, even if the something is being aware that they're doing nothing at the moment. Um, when you have to call several calls to the centers, which does happen a lot in teaching or with some movements, have the outsides watch, help, um, have the outsides memorize a few calls, you know, watch what they do, you're going to be doing this next, or give them something to in waves, for instance, if you've got or two face lines where you're working with the centers, circulate the outsides a couple of times, you know, give them something to do. There's a difference between cueing and cluing, but both are very important. When we talk about cueing and cluing, that says let dancers anticipate difficult or unusual flow or get affirmation when they need a little bit of help to keep it moving. In other words, if dancers are doing the call, but they seem just a little hesitant, but they're doing it right, get, yes, yes, give them, give them that positive affirmation. If the formation or, or position is a bit of uh, a different setup that they're not used to, you can clue rather than cue by saying, Okay, we're who's in the middle, you know, or on a recycle when we got the ends 
we don't have the, the boys on the ends of a right hand way. We got the girls say, who's on the ends? I'm now twig up, oh, wake up, oh, girls are on the ends. Recycle. I've cued them. No, I've clued them. And I just noticed I spelled cluing wrong on the slide. Okay. Give them that little indication, a little bit of help. Don't dance it for them through the mic, but give them that cue or that clue if they need it. Okay. It's not just one thing. It's a puzzle of all these things that go together. We talk about timing. Timing is a very powerful, powerful tool that professional callers use to great effect. Uh, and remember what I said, there's three aspects to timing, and it's not always based on how many beats are allocated by Caller Lab to perform a specific movement. These three aspects are lead time. In other words, how far ahead do you have to deliver the command to say it and give it to give the dancers that downbeat? The second one is command time. How long does it actually take to say the command and still give the dancers the next downbeat? So for instance, if the command takes two beats of music to say square through, you have to prompt that three beats ahead, square through, bang. So the dancers get that downbeat. And the third is execution time. How long does it actually take the dancers to actually perform the movement? Unfortunately, execution time is very important, but it's the one we give the least amount of respect to as, as callers. If the dancers take 20 beats of music to do square through, well, we let them do 20 beats of music to do square through. If it takes that long to teach it, use 20. But when they're dancing it, bringing them back to 12 beats from a static square or 10 beats from any other position. You've got to get them moving to the beat. And you have to be aware of that because that's where you have to go. How long does it take me to say it? Okay, it takes 10 beats to do a square through from here. I've got to go two beats back and I got to give them the downbeat. So I have to give my next command three beats back. You have to be aware of that. Timing tricks can be subtle and so subtle that they go unnoticed, even with those that are really, really experienced. Okay? But these are things that you have to be aware of. Stop and go timing. Stop and go timing. Um, I think Daryl mentioned this and Martin mentioned this earlier in the discussion, but it's awkward. It lowers the energy on a dance floor. The best dancing is smooth and continuous right from start to finish. And you want to always have that next call ready at the tip of your tongue. As Bob was saying, uh, if he calls something, he knows where it starts, what formation it ends with, and what his next three planned calls are. Well, that's what you should do. You know where it's going to take you. That way you can be smooth and deliver. Um, there are exceptions to this, of course, workshop or class, pausing briefly before and after hard calls lets the dancer see the formations, but that's teaching. When they dance it, you bring it back into the proper timing. And even if the dancing, even if dancing to you can't be nonstop all the time, such as teaching, explaining, etc., at least incorporate in your calling bursts of calls that are smoothly timed. You want to find that balance. You want to call so the dancers can keep their dancing motions smooth and with the music. So call just ahead of the dancers. If you call too far ahead, the dancers are going to feel rushed. If you call too slow, um, they're going to, oh my God, they're going to be stopping and waiting and waiting and waiting. Okay, You've got to watch the dancers in the slowest square that you wish to keep dancing and finish the next call command just before their hands touch to make the ending formation. And then slowly work to bring them up to the timing of the movements, even if you call. Head square through two, three, four, five, six, seven, right and left through two, three. You know, even if you have to do that, then do it. It'll get them moving with the music, but you've got to be on music. It's okay and it's even desirable to stack a few calls together in quick succession. But you must always, and I mean this, you must always wait for your dancers to complete them at a comfortable pace. If you stack too many, they're going to run or they're just gonna forget what you're calling. And if you never stack calls, it's gonna be stop and go, okay? Dancers need to feel the need to dance ahead of the beat eventually, leading to that stop and go. I go head square through four hands. Wait, 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 they're there, right and left through. But the same kind of problem can happen if I say head square through and a right and left through, then dive through. Wait, 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 wait. And okay, now they're finished the square through. Now they're doing the right and left through. And okay, now they're doing the dive through. I'm going to call another three calls. 
what the heck's going on. That's not comfortable for dancers. Okay? You don't want to call a long series of, and then put it this way, calling a long series of perfectly timed calls can leave squares with weak dancers struggling. Okay? You have to make those dancing adjustments. If you've got a weak square and you've got this long series of calls that you've stacked up, if you've got a weak square, you've lost them. You've got to find that balance. Early on, you may achieve better success with predictable stop and go. Example, calling every four beats and even two and three beat calls. So if you've got a call that takes two beats, give them the four beats when you're calling it to learn it, to get that predictable stop and go. But again, wean them back into dancing to get the beat and to get your timing and their timing correct as soon as you can. Consider walking distance. Uh, ends of lines or waves naturally have a longer distance to walk. Okay? Give dancers with shorter walking distance an extra short call. Uh, as an example, add a center's trade between a couple circulate and Ferris wheel. You know, couple circulate, center's trade, Ferris wheel. Now they've got that extra, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you've got to account for thinking time. Vary the timing of your delivery depending on how much time is needed to think about what that call does. Normally, the last syllable of a call, the last expression square through, lands one or two beats ahead of the downbeat, depending on the complexity of the call. Um, a totally expected call, such as right and left grand after an alaman left, that only needs to be one beat ahead. A harder call could and probably should come maybe even three beats ahead, so they know what to expect when they get there. When replacing an expected call with a surprise call, which we do quite often, for example, lines go up to the middle and back, do the right and left grant. Oh, wait a minute, where did that come from? Okay, you wanna give that ahead of time so that they've got the idea, there's that little bit of humor. Oh, okay, yeah, so obvious, but I need time to think and adjust to that. Okay, give the dancers the downbeat. I cannot stress this enough. If you count the music one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and you repeat that, you should hear that beat one is naturally more important. It's generally stressed more than the others. Similarly, beat one of four, beat five of eight is stressed. These are your downbeats. In your two, four timing, you've got one, three, five, seven. Okay. Uh, these are more important as dan dance beats. Depending on the phrasing and music, Beat one of each 16 or 32 or 60 board beat phrase can even be more pronounced than the other beats. That's the beat you want to give to the dancers. In the best music for square dancing, beat one of each musical phrase in that 64 beat phrasing and that whole 440 beats of music is often emphasized or anticipated in the beats that lead up to it in the music. So be aware of that. Study your music. Feel that. I'm going to say this. There's a lot of contrary appearance, uh, uh, opinions on this. Commands are not lyrics. Okay. Some people say, sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it, sing it. It's a lyric. Treat it as a lyric. Commands are not lyrics. They have to be different. It's natural to want to start dancing on beat one. However, it's also natural for callers to use their lyrics on beat one. That leaves a newer caller in a quandary. The song works better if your, your command lyrics start on the first beat. It flows so much better for you to sing, but it's not good for the dancers. If you give your commands in place of the lyrics, typically on beat one, the dancers begin hearing the first syllable of your command on beat one. They hear the last syllable on beat two or three. They interpret those syllables as a call name, think about their place in the formation, their role in the call, and finally step off. All that happens in beat, so hopefully on beat four, they're going to start maybe even beat five or six if they have to think or rethink a different application. You don't want to do that. You want your command to be lyrical, but not a lyric. You want it to fit into the metering of the song, but you don't want it to be a lyric of the song. You can potentially offer a better dance experience by prompting, that is thinking of the dancers and the timing, their actions to the music rather than the words. Uh, you need to take into account how much you're actually going to say and how much time they need to think. You probably already do this for things like side space, grand square, one, two, three, four, side space, grand square, boom. Okay, you lead that ahead. 
As you develop your calling skill, more and more of your calls can be issued in a similar way, offering the dancers an ever improving dance experience. Now, unless you can prepare or create call mini sequences at total 8, 16, 32, or 64 beats exactly in length, it's generally only on the first call that you can be reasonably expected to fall on beat one. Okay? After the first beat, it's usually satisfactory to keep your calling aligned to two beats. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If you can keep it aligned with that, generally you're going to be in time with the beats, in time with the commands, and giving the dancers that downbeat at every phrase. Unfortunately, a number of square dance calls take three, five, ten, or other non-even number of beats to complete, so that sometimes you have to do a little bit of fudging of the timing. This is a more advanced calling skill that comes with time, experience, and practice. I recommend until you're comfortable with the basics uh, as a new caller, fudge that two beat alignment. If it takes three beats, do four. If it takes one beat, do two. You have to do that. You've got to account for that thinking time and you've got to practice it. Again, the best way is record and dance to yourself being conscious of your lead time, your delivery time, and your execution time. Then watch and feel as you deliver your calls and see how you and your dancers respond. Did they step off when you expected it? If not, you may have to rethink that. We talk about difficulty. Now, there's a lot of aspects in difficulty. We've had a lot of sessions on difficulty. But what difficulty is, is basically judgment. Caller judgment is what makes things difficult. Judging the difficulty of a sequence is crucial to your success. It can also be the most daunting part of calling. We want to do what we think the dancers can do rather than what the dancers can obviously do. You know, we're thinking from our point of view of what we want, not what the dancers want or what the dancers need or what, even what the dancers are capable of. Many factors come into that interplay that affect overall difficulty. The first one, of course, is choreography. Are you using a rarely used call? Dancers don't have that call in their ready recall memory. So you may have to reintroduce that call starting with its most familiar use in order to do it. If you call it cold, oh, it's going to be difficult. How often do you use a call? The rare usage of a call means that dancers may have not seen this in a long time or it was used a long time ago. Use several times, use the call that you're going several times in familiar ways. For instance, if I was going to do slide through nine times as my goal for the uh, evening effect, I would want to be practicing same sex slide throughs well before I call slide through nine times. Um, is the formation familiar? Okay. Dancers may not understand an uncommon formation. So it could be advantageous to give that little momentary pause in your walkthrough or your cluing or your cueing to describe the formation with a hint. For instance, recycle from waves with girls on the outside. A clue might be who's on the outside or follow the girls boys while they're dancing. Just that little bit of a clue can help and go a long way if the position is unfamiliar. Uh, if the formation is unclear after a previously difficult call or series of calls, dancers are going to be too flustered by the last call to begin processing where they are. Say the formation name first. We do this all the time when we do difficult calls. We learn, uh, we're going to finish this, to, you know, blah, 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 do a whoppity do that splash lines up to the middle and back. Or everybody invert rotate your whoppity ding dong in your box of four touch a quarter, you know, you give them that formation that they're going to be in. It's just that little cue and that clue as to where they're supposed to be. Um, unfamiliar position or unusual arrangements. Arrangements have a profound effect on difficulty right into advanced calling. Okay? Most callers today use standard arrangements and they use them almost exclusively. And many dancers will be completely unfamiliar with some positions, even in the most common calls. Okay? We've got to think like dancers when we're calling. You've got to be aware of arrangement at all times and understand its effect on difficulty. Formation and arrangement are your two biggest things. The most successful callers are tracking arrangement almost all the time. Is the boy on the left? Is the girl on the right? Just as they should know the ending formation before calling any call, 
you should also be aware of the exact position of the boys and the girls in that ending formation or don't call it. If I call swing through, boys run, tag the line, cloverleaf, I should be aware that, ah, I can't call right and left through in the center or centers right and left through because I've got four girls in the middle. I know I'm in a double pass through, that's the formation, but I also have to be aware of that arrangement. To more gradually explore non-standard arrangements, consider uh, an arrangement where only half of the dancers are in an unfamiliar, unfamiliar position. Um, you know, for instance, one couple is boy-girl, one couple is girl-boy, when you start to do those funky recycles. Confusion with calls that have similar sounding or similar feeling um, definitions or explanations, okay? That's one of the things that causes a lot of difficulty. On these, you have to enunciate clearly. Example, chase right or face right. You know, what are you going to actually be calling here? Uh, use confused calls together in a single tip to let the dancers practice hearing the difference. But don't put them back to back. You want to use them together and really enunciate the difference between those two calls so they can hear the difference between them. Um, one trick is to pause the dancers briefly and let the dancers hear both call names. For example, if I'm in an Alaman bar, freeze. Now I could call slip the clutch or I could call shoot the star, which is it going to be. So freeze, shoot the star. Now they know what to do. And then I can wean off of that. That way they, their expectation is there, which leads us into the next thing, dancer expectation. That's the second part of difficulty. Familiar call combinations. Dancers can hear certain combinations frequently and they're expecting it. It's more difficult when you deviate from that expected. Head square through, and a right and left through. Veer to the left, Ferris wheel. What's the next call? Oh, most dancers are gonna go square through three or pass through. You know, if you do something different in there, they're gonna cause a pause. Looking at your flow and hand use again. Dancers expect hands to alternate. That's an expectation. They expect flow changes with those hand alternations. These are tactile clues that guide the dancers naturally in different directions so that you can use them to your advantage. Um, the dancer's focus of attention, that's a big expectation. Parallel ocean waves can be thought of waves of four or a box of four or centers and ends. Changing the focus from one to another in unfamiliar ways forces the dancers to do more thinking. So be very clear on what you want them to do. Um, you want to in, increase difficulty very gradually with dancers. Dancers don't expect a sudden hard call within an easy sequence. Uh, they generally, what you want to do is gradually introduce more elements to think about so the dancers are not caught off guard. Um, I've just noticed that there's two comments in the chat. Uh, I don't know what they are, but um, if you do have something to interject uh, Quickly, because this is a lecture series, please just jump in on me because I can't see you on that. We're just saying Happy New Year in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, so when I say increase the difficult gradually, you want to introduce more elements for them to think about, but you do it slowly so that the dancers are not caught off guard. One, one specific effect that causes success in this is let the dancers know an upcoming sequence can be a little bit unusual or difficult. Little things like, Trust me on this, and they're going, whoop, oh, wait a minute, what, 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 what's Bob Elling doing now? Trust me on this, or a pause. Some callers will lower the music when they're going to do something. Or think about whatever the call is from here. That's your clue at the beginning, and then you suddenly turn on your thinking thing. It just gives you that little pause, and suddenly you're doing the next sequence, which you never even thought about doing from that way before. Cueing and cluing. Um, before a call is delivered, that's pre-cueing, and it's often called cluing, set the dancer anticipation by alerting them to pay attention. In your own four, do this. On your own side, do this. That little bit of pre-anticipation alerts them, and they suddenly turn on. As a call is delivered, put emphasis. Uh, your voice inflection can alert the dancers to expect something unusual. After a call is delivered, this is your cueing, reinforce memory or teach without being obvious. Okay? You wanna give them that positive affirmation of 
yeah, I've done this, lines. If I'm doing flutter wheel and sweep a quarter and they've never done a sweep a quarter and I'm doing it from a, a box formation, flutter wheel, sweep a quarter, lines, boom. I've reinforced that ending position. Even though they were half sacheted or wherever, I've, I've given that reinforcement without being obvious. Use a different voice for your cues. Okay, You want to avoid confusion with the last calls. A lot of the time what happens is you're going to get a call and you'll hear some callers will call a movement like um, linear cycle. There's a good one. They'll call linear cycle. And they'll say linear cycle, hinge, fold, double pass through, peel to the right. Now, if you've got a dancer that's listening, but they're giving those commands and prompts, oh, wait a minute. Is that the next call? Or am I supposed to do something else? Or is he just... You know, linear cycle, hinge it, hold it, pass it, peel it. You know, that prompt has got to be different than the actual call. So it sounds different. So you don't get confusion with the actual call. I use that specifically because if you're following Caller Lab, you'll know there's a big heated discussion on linear cycle right now. Okay. Um, you want to avoid excessive cueing. Okay. Excessive cueing clutters the sound waves. Okay. It forces the dancers to pick out the calls from the chatter. For instance, if I call relay the deucey and I say half by the right and the boys go three and the girls move up and hook on the end, swing through six and boy get off and girl get on, swing through six, boy off, girl go three and the boy move up and there's your wave. Okay, I'm, I can prompt them through 20 beats of music, they're dancing, but they're trying to figure out what the heck am I saying and they're not focusing on what they're doing. It's too much. Um, a lot of the time it sounds also like you're spoon feeding or talking down to the dancers. And if you have to do this for all your calling, consider less demanding material or consider you're doing this for you. You're not doing this for the dancers. And more importantly, if you're calling to non-English speaking dancers and you do excessive cueing, you can confuse a lot of things because it doesn't always translate the same. The next aspect of difficulty is timing. And we've talked briefly about this. One, call stacking. Call stacking is used to make a series of easy call more challenging. Okay, avoid it when calls can be shortcut. Okay, because if you stack calls and they shortcut calls, then what they're going to do is they're going to really shortcut. Okay, stacking is a good calling technique, but it's a terrible technique if it's a bad habit or you're just not sure of your timing. Be judicious with it. There's another thing in timing called strategic timing. Deliver the next call movement. Uh, sorry, deliver the next call. If you deliver it, the last confused, the moment the last confused dancer figures out where they are, or when they're wondering, wandering around, or a wandering dancer gets close enough to a formation to pull it all together. So if I'm doing an eight chain four and I want to end something and I've got a confused dancer, now which way do I go? I'm going to hold the timing until that last confused dancer figures out exactly where they're supposed to be, and then I'm going to deliver the call. That way I'm reinforcing the success with that dancer, and all the other dancers already have it right. So you've got to really be strategic watching the dancers working on your timing. There's dancer confidence. Okay. Dancer confidence is critical to establish in the first few sequences of every tip. You've got to get them to come to you and be confident with you. They have to be comfortable with the caller's voice. They've got to be able to hear it and understand all the calls and all the cues and all the clues that you're going to use. And they've got to be able to separate that from any pattern that you use to fill in those blank spots. Dancer expectation is, that can they dance that material? In those first few calls, that material has to be appropriately difficult for the dancers or appropriately easy for the dancers to build that trust. They want to trust the caller to know what he or she is doing. Uh, they want choreography that resolves, cues, works more often than it doesn't work. Nobody's going to get it right all the time, but you want it to work more often than you, it doesn't work. Okay? And caller, you have to be confident because dancer's confidence is mirrored by the caller's confidence. And we talk about environment. There are so many factors to talk about environment that we can't cover them all. But some of the main ones are, one, sound. The caller's voice has to be crystal clear. 
That includes adjusting the equipment, the speaker placement in the room, the room acoustics, everything else. Okay. Sound, you say something, oh, I can't hear you, can't hear you. And so you turn it up. Well, chances are, if you turned it down, you'd have better sound. What you're hearing on stage is not always what they're hearing on the floor. Distraction. Is there peripheral activity going on? You know, or is there talking in and out of the square? Um, is there things on styling? Is it an unusual piece of music? Does the music have background lyrics? All those kinds of things. Background noise, I'm not talking about just the conversations, but you've also got to consider echo, reverberation, fan noises, music with instruments interfering with the caller's voice, what's going on outside, all those other kinds of things. Uh, points of reference, that's a big thing for environment. Um, does the room have an odd shape? Is the hall very large? Uh, are you dancing outside with no walls or boundaries? So you've got to have the reference of where is the caller? That becomes your head. That becomes the dancer's reference to orient on. Um, dance surfaces. You know, is it slippery? Is it sticky? Is it uneven? Is it hard? Is it concrete? Is it slow or like on a carpet? Or is it any one of a hundred other things that can make it uncomfortable? Consider the lights. Are the lights too bright in the hall? Like, is it is it an amplified sports theater where everything like a major basketball stadium that the outside is dark, but all the lights are hyper focused on the floor straight down? Is it too bright? It means you got reflections on the floor or is it too dark? Is it hard to see? You have to consider all of these things when you're talking about your environment and so much more. Okay. I'll leave you with this. Easy is better. So when in doubt, call easy and build up. A few dancers enjoy challenge all the time, but I can tell you most dancers enjoy dancing all the time. Okay. So really good judgment is nothing but a balancing act of callers meeting dancer expectations and dancer needs. We did a lot of sessions covering variety. So I'm just touching on some of the key points. Wow, I don't think we're gonna get through all this. <laughs> um, list coverage. You wanna use every call on the list more than once if possible, not just every night. Sorry, you don't want to use it every night, but you want to use them as often <coughs> as possible. The exception of that is if you're doing a teaching or a new dancer where you've got a limited list and you want to review all those. But once you get into plus, there's no way you're going to use every movement successfully with really good flow every night, every time you call. Some people come call us set it out to do that. I've yet to see anybody succeed and give a really good dance, but some may. They're a lot better than I am. Uh, use of each call. You want to use each call in a variety of ways from a, vari a variety of formations. And when we talk about formations, you want to use easy calls to get into less common formations. For instance, if you're getting into an eye formation or an hourglass or into a joint hand circle left when everybody's facing out. Use easier calls to get to that unusual formation. Uh, when we talk about arrangement, you want to explore all six arrangements in a particular formation using easy calls. And then once you've used it, normalize quickly to get the dancers comfortable. And if you're not familiar with those six formations, that's boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, boy, girl, girl, boy, girl, boy, et cetera. There's only six possibilities you can have with four couples. Um, opening calls. Try to use a different get in every time. Most people use square through, head square through, that's your, well, you side square through, there's a variation right there, you know, star through, California twirl, there's a variation right there. Consider the use of equivalence, get that variety in there. Use ring figures, use star figures, use circle figures, okay, avoid, when you use these, avoid using the same memorized figure each time. Review your notes, choose a different or an interesting opener. Uh, resolve into a ring figure. There's nothing wrong with you know, using circle left as a resolution. You get that partner line and they're expecting something you call circle left. Where did that come from? Ring figures that resolve at home or stir the bucket, use those as well. Use them judiciously. Use them not all at every tip, but you want to use them so they finish at home periodically or you want to stir the bucket periodically. At the end, and I say this, at the end of the pattern, you don't want to stir the bucket at the end of the singing call. It's just not comfortable. When we talk about resolutions, you want them to be simple and elegant. An element of surprise is always fun, but if everything is a surprise, nothing is a surprise. 
saying that, you want to have a few total surprise getups, but again, use them sparingly and keep them special. You want to balance Alaman left getouts with right and left grand getouts at plus. Don't forget Dixie Grand. It's Dixie Grand. When you hear Dixie Grand, you know you're waiting for an Alaman left or something at the end. Um, a few, and I mean that emphasis on few, a few at home getouts impress the dancers. Everything at home get out does not impress the dancers. It's tiring. When we talk about gimmicks, a little bit goes a long, long way. Um, if they get it, it's fun. If they don't, it's just weird. Directional calling, pulling something from a higher program or just calling directionally can be very difficult for non-native speakers. So non-native English speakers, I should say. So keep that in mind. When you plan, when you have difficulty, plan your difficulty. You want to modulate and adjust difficulty to make the dancers work a little bit and then give them a break. If you're going to have a harder tip, you plan a harder tip. Pre-announce it so that those dancers that are less serious about their choreographic jigsaw puzzle can plan to sit out. Make it a point to make it, make the first and the last tip of an evening extra easy and extra successful. You want them to come in with a good feeling. You want them to go out with a good feeling. And a lot of that goes into programming. Think of each dance you call, each tip you call, and each program you call like a story. A good story has a beginning, a middle, and an ending. You want to get into that story. You want them to read and perform that story for you. Dancers like a dance with a distinguishable beginning, a middle, and an ending. So you want your tip length between eight to 10 and 15 minutes. Okay, you don't want these long, long tips. That includes the singing call and the patter call. Okay, now that's gonna ver vary greatly between uh, clubs and callers. Personally, I like a four minute pattern, and a four minute singing call, eight minutes, that's it. Um, you want dancers to square up. Don't give them any more than two minutes. Fill all your squares, write down the key couples, everything in that time, and then start calling. If they don't wanna square up, that means they don't really wanna dance you might want to start rethinking what you're doing. Patter, four to six minutes. Singing call, three and a half minutes or, or whatever the length of your singing call. That's once, maximum twice through a record. That's eight minutes. That's more than enough patter. Okay. I say record still, even though it's all on digital. Your total tip length, if you're doing a tip that's 20 minutes long, you're way too long. And that includes even for a class or a workshop. If you can't teach it and get them dancing all within that 10 minutes, then don't do a singing call. Have, them have success with the pattern, come back to it in the next tip. Remember, difficult material is tiring. So keep those tips with difficult material a little bit shorter. Be aware of overload symptoms. Okay, if dancers start getting silly and making mistakes, it's time to wrap it up. You want to present to make the greatest positive impact at a, fest at a festival where other callers are present. At a festival, if you want to make the greatest impact, keep your tip the shortest. A four minute patter and a good singing call that complements your patter are the easiest ways with just a little bit of nuance and plan variation that dancers can succeed at. Sequence lengths should only be about 120 beats, one minute. If your sequence is longer than a minute before that resolution, you're going too long. You want that opening biggie, you know, five to 10 calls, usually easy with one at level call that can be a circle or a ring figure. Your dance sequence, 30 seconds to a minute, 15 to 20 calls, that's it. Occasionally longer, but not all the time. Workshop sequences, that's your teaching, your walking or your, your walkthroughs and all that, one to three minutes, but you wanna resolve quickly and as best as possible after a mistake happens, because it will happen. Your breaks between three and five minutes long between tips. Once through a record at low volume is a good cue. Some clubs have rounds, a round dance or two round dances, but there's no breaks between them. If they want a round dance, they round dance. If they want a square dance, they square dance and they choose where they want to take their breaks. Some club clubs have star tips as the break, okay? The worst thing you can do is I'm gonna, okay, I've got a mainstream and plus dance, but we're gonna have an A1 star tip and you use the A1 star tip as a normal tip. That means that one group of those dancers is going to be sitting out two full tips. If your tips are 15 minutes long, they're sitting for a half hour with no dancing. 
star tips are our star tips are the break and star tips should be very short i personally don't like them but every club is different when we talk music use music that has a good no. beat yeah go ahead can i ask what you mean by a star tip um for instance there's a lot of clubs that dance basic and mainstream and plus all on the same night but they have advanced dancers that are there or they may have a lot of advanced dancers in the club so those dancers a lot of the time especially in club run organizations we want to do one advanced dance to show the dancers what it is or on a basic and mainstream club they want to do a plus tip so that the plus dancers don't feel like they're being left out that's a star tip it's one tip at a program level that is different than what the actual dancing level for that evening is. And if you if some clubs have that all the time, some dancers want that all the time, if you're going to do that, make sure that that tip, that exceptional tip where only a very small percentage of the dancers can dance is the break. When you're finished that tip, everybody square up. You don't give them another break after that. It's called a star tip because on the on programs uh, where you're listing uh what the uh, uh uh what the tips are going to be it'll have a little asterisk next to it yeah i i personally hate them it, it means it says that hey look all you people that paid for the dance you're not ready to dance with us yet that's what it says to me um we're talking music you want music with a good beat that makes you want to get up and dance oh, mel yes on that star tip thing too uh sometimes you have that star tip because without those other dancers coming to the dance you wouldn't have a dance you don't have enough people I, to pay for the hall. i i agree and that's that's so, what i meant it's nuanced because some clubs demand that and some have to do that in order to get the dancers in but what i'm saying just, is a caller if you program a star tip that star trip that star tip is your break don't do it as an extra tip because oh yeah that's, everybody else to sit out that's how we do it in in santa clara yeah. when we when they have me do the advanced star tip there's no round dance in between and there's no break in between yeah and and that's the right way to do it if you have to do it i personally a lot don't of places like do the star tip uh after the dance is officially over yep yeah i pers i personally don't like them I'd rather have everybody dancing. I like a one level dance, but that's just my personal preference. I might okay. like that too, but I know we I have to we have to deal with reality. Those are supported. <laughs> I know we have to deal with the reality these days. Okay. I'm gonna move on to music here. Um, we want to choose music that has a good beat that makes you want to get there. You want to use music that excites you as the caller, because if you're not excited about it, the dancers aren't going to be. It's important to use a variety of music. It's very unpleasant to dance to the latest modern music every tip, just as it's very unpleasant today to dance to old fashioned fiddle music every tip. You want variety, you want different styles, you want different genres. It can all be country, but there's different beats and rhythms that you need to employ. Avoid music that's both singing and patter calls that does not fit your natural vocal range. Music should never make you sing too high or too low, mainly because it's dangerous for your voice. Um, use a variety of music genres for contrast and compensation of fixed tempo. We have a fixed tempo in dancing that 122 to 128 is generally where we sit these days. That pretty consistent. Most music you listen to has a variety of tempos. You want to use different genres to compensate for that. Um, introduction and one night stands choose good upbeat songs and try and use familiar tunes it doesn't have to be the most current tune but it needs to be familiar that the dancers can sink their teeth into when you're doing a teach workshop you want to choose a generic boom chuck boom chuck boom chuck that's not going to distract i call that the boring music uh, for your teaching and workshop but it's something with a good beat that has that good rhythm that's not going to distract such as a modern piece of music that it's got the lyrics that you've downloaded off a karaoke thing because it's got a good beat and the beat and the lyrics and the music is all playing in the background it's too distracting there's also sing-along work if you have silly songs or like to rock the house 
don't forget those sweet songs that get everybody singing like uh, home on the range or um everybody has a whole bunch of those you know caroline in the pines if you're in that particular area rocky top is another one okay every week do one or two of your best songs even at the risk of doing them maybe a little too often you don't want to do it every night but every now and then you want to repeat you want to have good new music you want to have variety music but there's some really really good songs don't worry about doing them every now and then repeat them we talk about theme tips theme tips need to be fun and easy for the first warm-up and the last tip they need to be challenging pre if, or sorry if it is challenging pre-announce it so people can plan to sit up if it's going to be a workshop call focus or concept focus that needs to be the theme if it's going to be silly that's the perfect timing for a gimmick or two okay? you've got to adjust this kind of stuff to your dancers desires some some clubs want the teaching first so that they know what's coming in the evening others want the teaching on the third tip some people don't want the teaching you have to adjust just the same as star tips remember beginning middle and end it's a story but you have to adjust it to the reader you have to adjust it to the dancer we talked a lot about showmanship over the last few years but it basically boils down to have a good time relax smile calling is supposed to be fun and if calling isn't fun the dancing is not going to be fun your stage presence dress like a professional even if it's a hobby okay it doesn't mean you have to wear a top hat and tails or a suit every time but you don't want to just show up in a pair of torn jeans and a dirty muscle shirt. Okay. Avoid being fidgety with your hands. Hold the mic in one hand, the cord in the other, you know, or do something. You don't want to be constantly doing this or playing with coins in your pocket, that kind of stuff. When we talk about singing, everybody can sing. Everybody can do a singing call, even if you're not a good singer. And yes, you can sing. The most important thing to help you sing better is to care about what you're doing. You've got to choose to be a good singer. The next most important thing is to totally know your material so you can relax. You've got to practice, practice, and practice. Practice in the car, practice in the shower, practice a lot. Focus on pitch, focus on being on key. Try to nail the pitch spot on. If you feel you're off pitch, don't hold those long notes in a song. Let it taper on and use the music. If, you, if you're off pitch, sing more quietly, the singing part. If you still can't nail, nail the pitch, Try speaking parts of the song. It'll make you sound better. When you sing more softly, you can sing higher and lower than you can if you're building a note. Just remember that. You can also sing more in tune and you can sing longer. That's what you have a microphone for. Let the microphone do its job. You do your job. Make sure you can clearly hear your music. You've got to match the volume of your voice exactly to the volume of the music. Blend it like harmony. If, you're not, if you aren't hearing yourself and the music, well, move closer to the speakers, reposition the speakers, set up a monitor, use earphones, whatever it takes. This is important. You've got to hear what you're going to be calling to, because if you can't hear it, you can't call to it. Don't fight your music. If it's not in your vocal range, get a different song. It's okay, because there's lots of good songs. It may be a wonderful song and the most popular, but if you can't sing it, you can't do it, and it's not in your range, ignore it. Plan to learn at least 10 songs to get that one song that you're going to be using. That's just normal. Your best songs are much easier to perfect. When we talk about voice, we talk about being yourself. Don't try to sound big. Use your everyday speaking voice. Just have a good time with it. You've got to learn to breathe, sing, and speak natural okay? from low down in your abdomen. Good posture helps with this. It pushes a lot of air out. You got to sing with your mouth open. Okay, drop your jaw, cheeks in, that deep, <gasps> oh, okay, enunciate. Um, make your voice clear. Can they understand every word? If they can't understand it, or if you're mumbling, you know, he'll riddle it through, and then you the star through, and the rat on through, and if you're mumbling like that, they're not going to understand what you're saying. You want to be clear. This is going to be contradictory, but do not work hard with your voice. Okay. Let your breath and let your microphone carry your voice. If your voice is getting sore calling, something is wrong. You're doing something wrong. You've got to learn to relax. With so much going on, it's easy to get tense, and this is going to ruin that beautiful singing voice that you're trying to develop. 
Now, there's a little thing that we talked about very briefly, and, and when Tony was here, he talked about it. It's called advanced voice. And that's calling to the beat of the music. That's adding those filler words to create the energizing rhythm in the sound. Okay. Remember, learning a lot of singing calls is going to help you develop that advanced voice. You've got to exploit your unique skills. Everybody's skills are different. Eric Hanelo is a master of putting in filler. Okay. But he does it when he needs to do it. You can do things like this. Some of you can whisper a song beautifully. Some of you can yodel. Some of you can whistle. Some of you can get that falsetto or impersonate the accent. Some of you have a natural vibretto that sometimes takes over it and you have to rein it in. But when you use it properly, wow. Those are your unique skills and everybody has them. Use them to your advantage. Um, vocal dynamics, sing softly, then increase your vocal volume to build energy and, and excitement. Um, sing, rhythmically chant your patter. Okay, I don't say sing your patter, but rhythmically chant it. Wheel the head to couple square, three when they get four hands around you, do find the corner, do side do. It's that rhythmic chant as if it were a singing call. And that's especially nice for your last tip. And you've got to constantly ask yourself, how do I sound? If you don't have a partner that can be absolutely honest with you or a mentor or something that's going to be absolutely honest with you, ask one of your adversaries. Okay, and I mean, I mean that seriously. Find somebody that really, oh, I'm not, not quite so sure if I like your calling and whatnot or, or they're your competition, ask them. Most callers are pretty good about this. Okay, have one of your friends shoot a video or record you while you're calling and listen to yourself. Music volume, slowly lower the music prior to speaking, slowly bring it up to fill within calls. Okay. That's slow. If you can't master that, keep it at one volume. Move away for your calling, bring it closer for louder. Take music volume way down while you're waiting for the dancers to correct the problems. You can stop the music or turn it all the way down while explaining and teaching or for the announcements. Do not have music playing during announcements. Um, think musical chairs, okay? music, dancing, no music, no dancing. It's that simple. Okay. Loud volume creates energy, but only if the calling lives up to, up to it. So if your music's really loud and a great piece of music, your calling better match it if you're going to have it that loud. When singing, make sure you can clearly hear your music, just like we said. Ideally, it's set the same volume as your singing voice. Okay. They've got to be distinguishable from each other, but they've got to complement. And when calling difficult material, lower your music a little bit so your words can be hear, heard more clearly. I've got connect with the dancers, tell them a joke or a personal story or interact with them, you know, laugh with them, admit your mistakes openly and honestly. Don't apologize, just acknowledge that's your mistake and move on. They want to know you're a real person and you've got to connect with them. If you don't have that connectivity, you've lost it. If you're going to tell a joke or a personal story, keep it really short. Keep it as an anecdote. Don't tell a 15 minute joke and call a three minute tip. They're going to, oh my God. Customize your routines. Choose music that's special for that group or for a season or a holiday occasion. Okay, this is all into your theming and your programming. Speciality tips. Use the theme event of the workshop or the class or the intro of two couplers, six coupled mixers or things like that. You want to customize your routine for the best impact of the dancers. And most importantly, thank your dancers. You want to warmly receive each and every tip and give them that thank you at the end with undivided attention and sincere eye contact. The best way to do that is leave your stuff on the stage, go down, thank them until you should be the last one out of that hall packing up your equipment. Thank each and every person that's helped in any way, publicly and privately. Let's have a big hand for, you know, bang. You know, it was a real pleasure to call for you guys this evening. Thank you very much. Make those announcements, make it personal. But for God's sake, do not forget to thank them. These are some of the things that callers do. These are the avoidance pitfalls. Some dancers are very sensitive about mistakes, especially if they make, in, make them in front of others. So try and look for indirect hints. Use, um, okay, we got right hand waves with the boys looking out instead of, Bob, you're facing the wrong way, turn around. You're in an ocean wave, Bob. No, Bob, your other right hand, Bob. I'm picking on Bob because Bob knows I'm only kidding with him. Okay. Yeah. Some dancers are very sensitive to things like that. You oh, gosh. You have to... It's not <laughs> oh. just 
the dancer that is sensitive to it, other dancers become sensitive to yep. it. And if it exactly, and if I did that to Bob three times, other dancers are going to go, what an ass. There's a thing called selective cueing. And that's when you're doing something and say, okay, very centered, look over the shoulder to the end of the line. I'm selectively cueing what I want them to do or selective calling. Those looking out of the square, do we U turn back real quick? I may only have one dancer looking out, but everybody's in their own square focus. I can correct that one dancer with a selective call and others say, oh, wow, okay. Were we right? Were we wrong? Oh, we're all good now. Selective timing. You're calling over here, oh, here, swing through. You know, everybody's, who, who's the dog? Yeah, ocean wave swing there, great. There's also corrective calling. Bend the line, lines up to the middle and back. That's corrective calling. And more importantly, there's things like positive reinforcement. Dancers don't like to hear their name with mistakes. But believe it or not, if I was saying, uh, square through and a whoppity splash, you're ding dong. Trust Bob, he knows what he's doing. Ah, great. Bob got it right. Boom. That's a positive reinforcement. Okay. You want to avoid blaming dancers, either directly or inadvertently. Okay. I wish callers were so perfect that we never made mistakes, but that ain't true. There are always ways to make things more clear. Don't say the same thing in a louder voice to try and make it right. Try a different explanation. Okay? All mistakes on the floor belong to the caller. Remember that. If the dancer makes a mistake on the floor, that's the caller's mistake. Part of the job is good judgment about the dancer's ability. So if you're calling something that dancer can't do, that's poor judgment on your part. Getting upset at the dancers, you never want to do that. It's not a good way to create a fun atmosphere. Okay. Um, word will get around very quickly about callers with bad attitudes that pick on dancers. And don't get stressed. Okay? You want to call it a, a sustainable level that allows the enjoyment of the activity. I just noticed that it's 10 o'clock. I've got um, just a couple more slides to go through. So if you bear with me, I'll be very quick. <laughs> Uh, like I said, this was a big summary. It's also a bit of an agenda, but these are the points and they're all gonna be laid out in the uh, material that's attached to this on the OC College website. So when we talk about difficulties, sometimes it is personal. Sometimes difficulties are personal. You've gotta be aware of that. It's a regular night, but the dancers seem to be making more mistakes than usual and their tempers are short and folks are simply not as polite as you or they are used to being. You've got to consider what's wrong. It could be any one of 100,000 things. You've got to consider, are there hearing problems? Has it just been one of those really, really long days or long weeks? And folks tend to be more tired during an evening session, especially on Friday evenings. Okay. Um, has it been a difficult and draining situation outside of dancing? For those of you that were dancing with COVID and you're there with the masks on and all this other kind of stuff and you're dancing this week and we're not dancing that week. We're dancing and we're not dancing. We're not dancing. Well, we've got a scheduled dance. Oh, we've got to close the doors because the rules change. Oh, those situations created all sorts of frustrations. What about aches and pains or discomfort? Okay. Did that dancer miss dinner or are they on some kind of medication for a condition they don't want to talk about? Okay. Have they not been sleeping well? Um, are they new and very nervous about their dancing? Are they rusty? You know, they thought they knew the calls better, but this is, oh, total frustration. You know, you can do any one of a million things. You, you forgot your full moon. <laughs> full moon. That, that's one of the other million things. Okay? <laughs> if you find yourself getting upset because there's difficulties and you feel that frustration, stop and consider. Are there other interpretations of their actions? Is it you or is it them? It's always going to be you, even though it may be their personal problems. That are affecting them, it's you because it's your responsibility to be able to judge that floor. And the only way to do that is to have patience to go through with what they can do and build that confidence and build that fun to give them that success. Never discount anyone, even the awful dancers, even those horrid dancers have friends. And some of them may be important to you someday. That horrid dancer may be friends with the person that's involved in the hiring committee for the big festival. You get frustrated and you have a hard time with that dancer and you, you've taken your stress out on them, guess what? 
they have friends. Remember that that one irksome dancer that you've had through your class and having all those personal issues that you didn't take into account and you finally just, eh, that's probably gonna be the dancer that one day is gonna be running that club and hiring your callers. So patience, patience, patience is going to lead to success. That's your judgment. Mel? Yeah? Uh, one other thing about never call a dance in the US on the day before Thanksgiving. Why is that? People's mental focus is on the next day, dinner, family, and everything else. I've had 10 squares that couldn't do a square through, you know, and they were good dancers. They're just, they can't focus on the dancing portion of it. They're distracted. Yeah. So that's, that's one of those other things. Sometimes it is personal. Their personal thoughts are based on family. So those are things that you have to consider. Excellent point. Okay, some closing thoughts. Some days are diamonds, some days are stone. Everybody's gonna have good days, everybody's gonna have bad days, especially as a caller. Guess what? That's called life. That's the same for everybody. If your people are having a good time, the caller's doing it right. Take notes of what you're doing. If, if one caller says, hey, I don't agree with swing your partner from a double pass through, but those dancers are doing it because that caller set it up and he does it every day and the dancers love it and they're having a good time, guess what? That caller's doing it right. He's giving the dancers a good time. That caller has judgment when and when not to use it. And if they've got new people, they'll introduce the concept so that they can dance. That's called calling. And all of this is part of calling. Creative and unusual material is like spice. A little bit of spice goes a long way. You know, chili pepper is really, really good. But you put too much of that in, guess what? That meal is ruined. But it's a wonderful spice. It is truly difficult to call easy material. Okay? I stress that. That is the hardest thing for callers. That's why you get so many callers at the advanced and challenged level that have a real hard time calling basic dances unless they're calling it all the time. They have to know the material but it's very difficult to call easy material with a limited program. That takes true practice and true skill. Dancers are having the most fun when they do things that they didn't know that they could do. That doesn't mean you're teaching them something new every, every night. It just means that they're doing something different. For instance, if I do heads half sachet, and then I do something like a square through four. Wait for it. All right, here, here's what I want you to do. Circle to a line. <gasps> I've got a couple half sachets. I'm, that's not the best choreography, but you get the idea. Right? Now I end up in a girl, boy, boy, girl line. They did a circle to a line. It's not difficult. Everything is, flows exactly the same. The couple doing the twirl is still doing the twirl, but it feels so truly different. They knew that they didn't know they could do that but they, they could do it, they've already done it. Good judgment comes from experience, experience comes from bad judgment, okay? You're gonna make mistakes as a caller, you're gonna make some absolutely horrific mistakes. The secret is accept the fact that you made a mistake, don't hide from it or try and correct the dancer. If you made a mistake of bad judgment, accept it, oh, that's my fault, move on. Don't dwell on it, give them a good experience after that. The ideal caller is not a leader. The ideal caller is a follower. A follower is the caller who has the skill and the energy of the dancers to guide every call that they're going to use. You're aware of what the dancers can do and you wanna make them better. You wanna give them the best time. You wanna do that and to only do that, you have to follow their energy and their skill. You lead them by following what they are able to do and make them better. You've got to remember that it takes time to be a caller. It takes time to be a teacher. It takes time to be a dancer. And everyone is different. It takes time and practice. And how much time we take is going to be different for every single one of us. Right. As I said, this, this one was more of a lecture synopsis of what we've done over the last four years. Yeah, it's been four years already. Wow. 
and a bit of an agenda of some of the topics that I want to delve into in a little more detail individually, um, although we've covered a lot of them already, we want to look at them again in sequence. So let's open the floor up for discussion. Do we have any questions, Mark? Mark I have Stowell. a comment. <laughs> yeah, glad to have you back. Oh, thank you. Okay. All right, let's open it up for discussion. Although this, this like I said, this this is all pretty common sense, and yeah. the whole presentation and the what I, I discussed here is going to be in the notes, as will be the handout. Um, but there are so many aspects to calling. I'm just touching on the periphery of the prime topics that most callers need to know about to become better callers. Whether you're brand new, whether you're experienced. Or more importantly, whether you're mentoring a new caller, which I hope each each of you with experience is helping new callers develop their own skills and is able to focus on these things. So uh, the first hand up I've got is Bob. Okay, there's one thing that I kind of disagree with you when you say don't sing your patter. I okay. what how most people take that and most callers do it and are doing it today, their patter is monotone. And it yep. should not be. When I learned to call, I was fortunate. Uh, this this other learning to be caller said, first thing you gotta do is learn to count. Play your patter music and count one, two, three, four. Now you're the bass player, follow the beat. One, two, three, four, yeah, and follow the bass pattern and learn to do that. And I do that with my pattern record. So I call it head square through with a go and I get four hands around, you know, do side do and the outside pair and then you swing through, you know, whatever it is, your dancers will be better if you do that. And you'll sound better and dancers will like you better versus the guy that said head square through four hands, swing through, boy run bend the line and if you don't think that callers do that you're not on the same planet that i live on i think i think where we're looking at here bob is the difference of the terminology that i use i say don't sing your calls you want to call your calls you want to sing your song in patter again i will stick with what i said don't sing your patter but uh, you noticed in, in what I was presenting, I also said what you want to do is you want to rhythmically present your calls that they work with the music, but they're not sung. So, for instance, if I'm using a slow patter, but it's got a good beat, my melody line is what I'm going to be singing to, not the beat. What you're calling to is the beat for the dancers to work with. So, And, and you gave a perfect example. If I have, for instance, a slow patter or I've got something like Kini, which has got that really vibrant beat to it, I'm not going to go, well, I head to couple square through and I get four hands around you do. That's singing it. That's singing on a monotone. I am going to, however, go, well, I head square through and I get four hands around with you. Find the corner, no side of one time, you know, make a wave and swing through. I'm rhythmically chanting with the melody line and the beat of the music. And the differentiation in singing is using the song as lyrics. In patter, I agree with what you're saying because the chanting will almost sound like singing. Where it becomes a real problem is in singing calls. For instance, does everybody know the song, What's Forever For? If love never lasts forever, well then what's forever for? Yeah. If you've got that and you say, Will the head to couple square through four hands around? You're going to lose the dancers because you're singing, you're using the song to present your lyrics. You're getting your head to couples as the lyrics. You're not calling as opposed to head square through and get four now. I've called the call, but I've sung the song. There's a difference between them. And I will stick to calling choreography is not lyrics. You present them as a chant or as a lyrical chant, but they are not lyrics of a song. Uh, and I think I think we're saying the same thing just differently with Patter. Yes, well, you know, 
excuse me, Helen. I Sorry, wanted. go ahead, Bob. Bye. Let Bob finish. And the thing is that I've come across callers who have been taught not to sing the patter part of a singing call sound horrible. And I've coached yep. them, and all of a sudden they learn that they can be very good. Now you can't let the 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 song overwhelm the commands, okay? But you can hit those notes when you're doing it as you just did. So I'm sorry I interrupted, Helen. You should be next. No, you're you're absolutely correct, Bob. And within that, I, I just want to stress what you said before. If you're doing what's forever for head square through do si do, that's just as bad. That's actually worse. Okay, you need to find that rhythm and that excitement because your voice is your tool in calling. And absolutely great points, Bob. Helen, you're first, and then Chris. Oh, well, okay. Well, <clears throat> what I was going to say is, as I'm uh, calling to Swedish-speaking people, and some of them don't speak English, and I do basic beginners, uh, I don't say anything except the calls, and it is quite boring. So I have to make my voice very exciting for there to be some kind of life in the calling. But I can't use these extra um, words like. Um, I can't think of them right now, but uh, the ones that you want to call, and sometimes it's really difficult for me not to say them because Helen, some people don't understand it. Yeah. What you can do, I think, is called scat. Now, the head square through what I do, bop a do, bop a do, bop a do, and I do, so I do, go, 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 and wing, you know, and just do nonsensical rhythmic things to the music. And that works, and that allows you to give that music feel to it. Yeah, yeah one, of the, one of the things that I, I cannot remember who the caller was, uh, but this was in Germany, and I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, called his patter like I heard a singing call done. And the lyrics, the song and everything else was in German, the calling was in English. And I, I've heard songs done in different language, which is great. And I think there's a few Swedish ones. I, I do um, high road, low road. I've got a version of that that I actually sing in Russian, <laughs> but I call in English. But I heard this caller and I wish I knew who it was. He had rhythmic chanting, cueing and cluing in German, but the calling was in English. And I, I have no idea, you know, like head square through would be the command and then I, I, I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it was like that. That's an oversimplification, but it was absolutely fantastic. And I wish I had a recorded example because you can hear what is going on. But it did not interfere with the calling. But for German speakers, it was perfect. It's just like, you know, what English speakers do in a lot of cases where they give the cluing or give the prompting. You can adopt counting. those things for you. Counting you can do in any language. And I did it in Japan, each knee sanchi, head square through each knee sanchi, and the dancers got a kick out of it. Yeah, just be sure if you're going to, if you're an English speaker and you use it in another language, that you don't mix words that sounds sound familiar. My example of that was ordering poutine in, in French, which is chips with cheese curd and gravy on the top, beautiful. But there's a difference between poutine and poutine. <laughs> one is chips with curds and gravy. The other one is a prostitute. So you have to be very, very careful what you're saying and nuances. So if you're going to use scat in a different language, be careful. <laughs> Chris, you got your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to make uh, a couple of observations. Um, the uh, I'm sure that uh, that you're that you're both saying the same thing about uh, not singing the calls, and I, I think it has more to do with the timing than the other parts of singing. In other words, uh, and we're talking about pattern here, that the um, uh, you're going to you're going to vary. Well, you're going to have a, some kind of compatible rhythm that's going with the music, and you and you can modulate the the tones that you're using, the notes essentially. So, I mean, you could call that singing, but the but it's uh, but it's where you put the it's where you put the call words that you're saying. Uh, and if you try to put them on the regular beats uh, of the music uh, spaced out uh, 
spaced out just the way the 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 phrases are coming that's not that's not going to work you got to you got to get the calls out as calls in sort of you know coherent coherent little chunks that that, that they can do you know so absolutely so, so I mean, you, 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 it's kind of singing, but uh, I, I guess that's why we like to use the word chanting because uh, well, it, it, it implies. Yeah, I, uh, I, I used to use the terms when I was taught this. There's a difference between lyrical and lyrics. And a lyrical delivery, especially with square dance calls, a call has a specific command structure. It's got a specific command timing and it's got a good delivery that is all part of that command. And it is different than the lyrics of the song. But as, as Bob is, is very, right. very rightly saying, it has to be lyrical for the delivery, but still distinguishable from the rest of the material, whether it's in patter or whether it's in a singing call. It's not a lyric of the song or a song lyric. It's lyrical that matches the metering and the song and the rhythms of the song, but still gives the best dancing experience to the dancers so that they can anticipate it keep the dance beat and keep that. And that's why it's not lyrics. Lyrics go with the melody line. Calling yeah, the, does not go with the melody line 99% of the time. Yeah, I mean, the, the music is always driving when you're going to open your mouth, but the, yeah. but, but, but how much is going to come out at once it, it needs to be determined by the call, not so much by the music. But even in singing calls, if you go back to your um, uh, What's Forever For example, right? that you can <clears throat> that there there's plenty of opportunities to totally sing the calls if the uh, depending on the call right so you know, heads promenade go halfway and uh or you could say you know oh the heads you promenade well you go halfway you can you know because they don't need that other part of the information until they're already going but i got the call out right away but then you can kind of sing along with the with the with what would be mm -hmm. lyrics to the song to get the rest of it out before you know uh before it's, but but you know after you you know come down the middle and square through you bet you better not go swing through da da you right you got to go swing through da 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 so and that's um, that's that's the difference between a command yeah. and a lyric yeah and, 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 but in the in, in singing, singing calls too in but singing, in singing calls, calls you can get a, you can get away with a lot more of seeing yes. where the lyrics will be depending on exactly what it is you need to say. But a, a good example for that is the song Desperado or the song Hallelujah. If you listen to those, most people say 4-4 four, four is fast timing. Well, those are 4-4 four, four, and they're quite, quite slow. So if, if you've got something like Desperado, why don't you come to your senses? Okay, that's fairly slow as the lyric, but if I do head square through, or heads promenade and go halfway. You could probably get away with that on a promenade, but your delivery of the following call has to be anticipatory ahead of where they're actually going to do that. The right. song lyrics will not allow that if you're going to sing them as lyrics. So you have to call them in a rhythmical, lyrical way that matches the song but does not interfere with the song lyric or does not become hidden as part of the lyrics. And I think this is more along the line of what Bob is saying. One of the worst things that you can present is head square through, do si do, swing through, boys run, Ferris wheel, dot, 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 I am a robot. <laughs> okay, right. it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to have that lyrical rhythmic presentation but it's not a lyric of the song. And that's, that's why I try and differentiate. That's why I use chanting or a, 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 a rhythmic chant as opposed to lyrical and lyrics because the two terms tend to get confused sometimes. That's, yeah. that's why taking a piece of pattern music and learning to count and be the bass player, you know, and just boom, 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 and do it with numbers and you'd be surprised how fast your pattern starts to change. Oh, you're abs absolutely, absolutely correct. The thing on I'm that. noting is that it's it's really the same, whether it's a singing call or a patter, it's yeah. it's really the same principles that we're talking about here in, in terms of the delivery. With the singing call, there's more subtlety uh, sometimes. Right. So some typical figure is going to be head square through four, start out with a head square through four, right? 
Um, and you can you can you can shoot the head square throughout, uh, which they're pretty much expecting you to say anyway. If you if you if you're doing a singing call and you go head square, you know, at a plus dance or something, they pretty much know that the next word out of your mouth is going to be through. So already we have a little tiny wiggle room there. And then about the uh, forehands part, well, you know, it's even kind of optional whether you mention the forehands or not. So you can you know head just square through forehands and go now, right? Yeah, um, and that's and, that's the difference between the command and what augments a command. Um, I'm going to put on a couple pieces of music. I want to know if you can hear this first, though. See if it's going to work. Can you hear this? No. Sounds like it's in a bottom of a bucket. Sounds like it's coming out of the toilet bowl or something. I was kind of hoping that would pick it up, but I've got original song on. But that's um, Despacio. Hang on, I'm trying to figure out how to turn it off. <laughs> I still haven't got this. That That's the original sound. Oh, hang on, let me try and turn this on. Let's see if that works. See if this is any better. If it's not, I'll... is that any better? Yes. Okay. So you can hear that. You can hear the rhythm of that. To that compared to say this that's got a much stronger melody line By yeah, the way, this is one of uh, the Chattanooga Shoeshine Boys, one of my favorite patter songs. Okay, well, that, that's exactly what it is. This is one of those that it's not a singing call, but it can be used because it's got such a very strong melody line that goes to it. Now, if I was going to call it in square group, Overwhelming. That's still a chant. Um, yeah, but you're, you're 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 in pitch. You're in pitch. That's right. And there's things that you have to do to find that. But what I don't want to do with that song is go heads square through. Because it goes down, down, down. I want head square through. It's got to be a command. I've got two beats. I've got to deliver that instead of the six beats that go with that bass. And that's the difference between being lyrical or using it as a lyric. That may not have been the best example. In patter, you can get away with a lot more um, using the lyrics of the call if your timing is right. Or sorry, using a lyrical calling if your timing is right to allow the dancers to dance. In singing calls, it's a bad habit to get into because if you're using your calls as lyrics, you tend to use the music melody line and you end up stealing that first beat, that downbeat from the dancers because it's much easier to use lyrics, to sing lyrics to a song than it is to syncopate your lyrics outside of the song 
and keep the rhythm and lyrics of the song with the song. That's a skill that develops. That's one of your advanced voice uh, skill techniques. Does that kind of answer where you were going with that, Helen? Yes, but it doesn't really help me with my problem. But I, I understand. No. Okay. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I understand so what you're saying. Now, if if we take that and we put it into Swedish, your calling, you want to have that rhythmic delivery, not uh, as Bob says. You don't want to have a heads square through. You want to get that with a lyrical delivery that meet, matches the metering of the song. And if you've got good music with that lyrical delivery, you can have a lot of gapping. You can let the music carry itself and take you through a lot of that. You can use, as Bob was maybe suggesting, some kind of scat rhythm or a counting rhythm or anything like that as your filler if you need to have filler. But um, I'm not in a position to coach you on that. Uh, Mickey is, I think you're here, aren't you, Mickey? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Uh, Okay, it only looks like it. And Martin and a few other callers over there uh, are very well placed because they know the nuances of calling to non-English speakers and finding where is I'm going to fill that in for a, an audience that doesn't speak English. And I think that would be an excellent session for something for ECTA or that area to have a look at because it really, really enhances it. There are some really good videos, uh, Japanese callers, there's a couple of Russian callers that are out there that show them doing this using that kind of explanation that you might be able to draw some better information from. Yeah. Join color school right before main pack. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. I wish I wish I had a much better answer for you, but that's really about the best I can give. Uh, anyone else have any comments? Like I said, today's presentation was a uh, pretty much a forward into what we're going to be looking at, what we have looked at over the last four years. I still can't believe we've been doing this for four years now. Um, Yolanda is, is she, Yolanda still with us? No. Oh, there no. she is. Oh, there she is. Yolanda was one of the early ones that was started with us. I believe it was February 2019 we had our first Zoom sessions back then. So it's been going for a long time and it wasn't until about January, February 2020, we actually started recording these things. Um, it was one of Yolanda's suggestions was, is there any way we can record these and actually put that material up there so we can have a reference material? And then Mark got on board and we started doing that. And I want to express my thanks to everybody, Bob, Mickey, Daryl, uh, Chris, and everybody that's been coming in regularly, as well as all of those that have been presenting. Uh, don't don't um, shy away because I fully expect to be nudging you or tapping you on the shoulder for more presentations in the future. But please, if you do have any suggestions or any topics you want to look specifically at, uh, let me know. Uh, the next couple of sessions that we've Mickey got... Mickey and I are going to do one soon on linear cycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have decided that it is not a four or a three-part call. It's actually a five-part call. Well, I, I did it as a two-part call. Oh, no, no. It's, it's got five distinct parts to it. Oh, to me, it only has two. <laughs> well, I just uh, call in there a cycle and they do it. Yeah. Uh, but I, I use, as I did when I explained my two-part thing, if you watch dancers do a linear cycle, they do not complete the double pass-through they go to their ending spot. You see, and that, that's strange because when I learned it, that was an absolute must. But, you know, we, we talk about these things, we've got two thirds. Now, if, if we're going to make, somebody put up the example, recycle is hinge, fold, follow, face. What? Um, I'd rather go for hinge, circulate and face. I wouldn't this even would do be that. a proper definition for the mainstream program. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't because recycle is a no-hands movement. We're talking about recycle stick and dance with no recycle. hands. No, we're talking about recycle. Oh, recycle. Uh, just, just, somebody put the comparative up that that should be a four-part movement. And I went, what? And like I said, when I learned recycle, I learned it in Germany. I actually thought that the first part of recycle was clap your hands. All right. Because yeah. that's what and I was then, taught. Clap your hands. Spin the lady, yeah. right? No, no. Actually, I was taught 
because and the reason it was this was Kim Lindner at the time, and the reason was because he was tired of unteaching that reach across the lady and pull her around like a lawnmower, girls turn back, wheel and deal, because it locked everybody into unlearning how to do the 64 possible variations of recycle when there's really only one way to do it. Well, that's like guys... uh, that's like trade the wave is a two-part call, right? You take a peek <laughs> and then trade the wave. But those are discussions for another time. Uh, we, we do have, uh, I've got two sessions that are planned coming up and I am looking for more ideas and more sessions and more presenters. And like I said, I don't limit presentations. Uh, I think Janet Lewis was with us earlier. She gave an excellent presentation in one of Bob's sessions about uh, her, her way of doing call analysis, which was different. Uh, we've had um, all sorts of people on here doing presentations. Uh, Martin, I see you got your arms crossed there, so I guess that means you want to do one as well. <laughs> uh, but by all means, um, if you have something that you want to share or you think is worth sharing, let me know because it doesn't matter if you're brand new to this activity, your perspective is great. One of the biggest things I have ever learned in calling is how much I can refresh myself by going back to basic fundamentals or going to a caller school for newer, newer callers and just either auditing, sitting in or taking because it refreshes my perspective and gets me to look at things again, which I may have known, but have been put in the background. It also allows me, um, as Daryl was saying right at the very, very beginning of these sessions, there's a lot of aspects of calling, such as formation and arrangement management, that are so simple that we dance over them as callers or in caller teaching, that if we had spent more time on them, a lot of these complex things that we do would have been a lot simpler. I've got two sessions planned uh, so far. The next one uh, I'm looking at is again fundamentals and I'm looking at fundamentals and that's teaching techniques and then there's another one I call double dipping and this is an expansion of something that we all know but we're probably not aware of and that's making the most of your modules using less modules but almost using the variety of one module exponentially at least four times with just a minor change and not changing. I made a very bold statement that every partner line to or sorry, every partner line to corner box module is a corner box to partner line module and every corner box to partner line module is a partner line to corner box module, every single one of them. And we'll talk about that. And when, once you once you see that it's something you already knew, but you didn't know you knew it. So there's there's my little teasers. Uh, we're definitely going to have Mickey back. Uh, hope, hoping to have Bob back. I'm still trying to convince him to come back. And Daryl definitely still owes me a session. And uh, Chris and Mickey are going to give an excellent presentation on caller lab definitions and why they are as they are. Why Swing has two lines of definition and almost three pages of explanation. <laughs> things like that um, but yeah stay tuned and if you have ideas let me know let's open the floor up to general conversation wow <laughs> welcome back everybody I, I didn't get a chance to uh, say it yet but happy new year everybody <laughs> yeah happy new year oh golly it's almost happy valentine's <laughs> Our next session is going to be on the 29th of January, and then the one after that is the 12th, I believe, of, yeah, 12th of February. So we're still going to carry on with the fortnightly sessions rather than the weekly sessions. So, so oh, is that what bi-weekly is? Is a fortnight? <laughs> yeah. Well, bi week know know that. twice a week or once every two weeks. It's a great language that we have. <laughs> Was that you marking it on your calendar, Yolanda? <laughs> you want to put me down, Mel? Put me down. I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, just, just flick me an email. 
I sent you a voicemail just now. Uh, you? Oh, you want the topic? <laughs> well, that would that would be good. Do you do know, my original know. topic uh, part two. <laughs> We'll, we'll, we'll call it Bob's Bitch Session. There you go. No. <laughs> you can do that, too. Boy, I could do a session. <laughs> well, you're, you're always welcome. Yeah, just just flick me an email or uh, I don't think. Uh, if you're, you're sending me a voicemail, to what number are you sending that? No, I, we just did it. <laughs> oh. You pick a date and we'll do it. No worries. I will send you an email confirmation. I, I guess you call it mental image. I don't know. I don't know I, what it's called. It's called it's called knowing where you're going. <laughs> well, your, your last session, what we focused on, we were looking at the chicken plucker technique, and we looked at the chicken plucker slash turkey plucker, whereas the chicken plucker takes you out of sequence for the right-hand box. You like to keep them in sequence and working because it allows you to keep a better control of the dancer and that was the crossover between uh, the module and the mental image aspect of resolution in a right hand box that was your last session that's just okay what I off the top of my head I, I, I think of, of doing a turkey well to me a chicken plucker is keep a men sequence let's establish yeah. that and a turkey plucker was having one either the boy or the girl out of sequence and as it turns out that if you do a pass through trade by and it, that's a turkey plucker and one of the people about a sequence is zero. You got the same uh, same way, the same get out if you do that. And knowing that helps a lot and knowing that surprises the dancers. They did a pass through trade by. They think they got to go back across the square to get the corner, and all of a sudden their corner's there because you use the same get out. An example would be head square through ah, swing through. Spin. Stop! 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 Okay. Stop, stop. Save it for the presentation. Okay. That's that's <laughs> that's the teaser. <laughs> so let's see. I'll, I'll I'll actually put you on the calendar. Give me a second here. <laughs> Uh, where are we here? Calendar, February 12th, February 26th. Okay. Bob Elling on Let's Talk Turkey. But wouldn't that be something more for the autumn? Like when it gets to Thanksgiving? He doesn't want to hear me. He doesn't want to hear me till November. <laughs> no, you're, you're booked in uh, February 26th. Okay. Choreographic control. That's what I call it. Yeah, man, but serious. I'm not sure whether this would be of interest for 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 the group um, of how color lab works or it, how, what's with the definitions. How do we work with the definition? What's behind the process? Going from the committee, working in the committee, going back to the uh, definitions committee, coming back to the the program committee, um, and and see what the work is and how you can uh, get involved and join especially after Kolev has um, put down the fees for overseas color. So um, people may would like to see what goes on behind the scenes and how to get uh, uh, be a part of it and get involved. So um, maybe this is something to think about. Well, um, uh, we had Teresa and a few others come in here with a session on that. Uh, that would be two years ago. And I've sent messages to Harlan, to Teresa and whatnot, because I wanted to have a presentation on Caller Lab or a couple of presentations, one on Caller Lab itself, being a member of the benefits and all that, but also on the various committees, how they work and establish and how these definitions are sorted and redone and what the processes are. 
but not just a cursory three line. This is how the committee works. Um, you know, a long time ago, I haven't got any response have, back. Uh, but now that now that we know somebody on the executive, <clears throat> um, hopefully we'll get a little bit more push. The Crawler Lab, uh, I think, uh, at least uh, in the past, had a uh, little um, some kind of convention, some kind of convention for the European people over in Europe, obviously. Yeah, it was a mini lab. Yeah, mini they, lab. They, yeah, and do they still do that in Europe, and they've actually had one in Australia, but they ceased to be. Uh, it's something that was maybe being looked at, but I haven't seen anything in the last six years of anything. There are definite. plans to have something similar again, and even uh, things smaller called micro lab. Uh, um, so, no, but what I'm talking about is like you know taking a call, which is uh, in a committee, whatever it is. Let's say mainstream or whatever. And since I'm vice chairman of the mainstream committee and, and I'm member of the definitions committee due to the chairmanship, and I'm also a member of the um, um, applications review committee, this is all works in together. And it's very interesting to see if you have a definition of a certain uh, call, it should be changed for what reason ever, how the process works, um, and then how it gets forward to the definition committee who writes the definition and it comes back after discussion and voting back to the program committee and then it's out for use and then maybe you have some requests by callers or misuse of the definition which goes for final decisions or further decisions to the applications review committee and then it comes back where it says it's proper or improper or whatever and uh, in order to find a, a common ground in a way in which we can uh, move the dancers without confusing them and have a common language. And I think this yeah. process may be all over, be interesting for, for, for callers. It sounds like you and a few committee members in Harlem need to get together and uh, say yes on this date. Preferably, I would say early March would be a good time. No, Christmas, Christmas. Yeah, no, 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 no. Actually, actually March, March, yeah, early March or early April at the end at the latest because well, by that time, by that time we're winding up and this is where unfortunately we get into a lot of the hysterics because that's at the end of April end of May comes the dance by definition improve your mainstream improve your plus a lot of those workshops are introduction to where a lot of these definitions do get bastardized in their use by callers saying we're going to do this DVD and you know we're going to do a three-quarter linear cycle when we've got a three-part definition or we're going to do a two-thirds linear cycle where we've got a four-part definition and fudging explanations i'm only using that because that's the current hot topic is linear cycle well my time to, schedule i would is love to book. see a presentation like that especially on the big gap that we have between definitions review period definitions uh, annual it, which there should be an annual review a triannual uh, fix and then an affirmation of the ARC. And unfortunately, the ARC is where it's lacking and falling apart, where definitions change, because the ARC doesn't update as often as definitions change. Well, let me say, I'm, I'm booked all the way uh, to the end of March. And uh, at the end of April, there is the Color Lab Convention. So when then it would have to be at the beginning of April or beginning of May? Either or. Regarding my time schedule. I leave Based so you could on. talk about any changes made at the convention. Yeah, yeah well, I, I leave that to you, Mickey, because I think that's one that you probably want to have, not just yourself, but probably a few more reps of Caller Lab, because I'd like to also see, well, what is it we have? If Well, Harlan or even Clark Baker, he callers, was involved in the process. Yeah. Yeah, if all of the callers in Europe, Australia, Japan, China, Russia got together, they could really, really change Caller Lab on votes because there are more of them than there are American callers. And that's an, I don't know if that statistic holds true. It was true about 10, 15 years ago. But oh, by it, the way, so, is there uh, is there sport dancing in China? I was just wondering about that the other day. Yes. Yes, there yeah. is. There's actually yep. two types of square dancing in China. There's square dancing, which is dancing in the square. And then there's square dancing, which is what we know it as. Right, right. There's also square dance in Taiwan. We have already registrations for the main pack from yep. Taiwan people. Good. So, 
it, it is it is one of those things and it it's one of those unfortunate things that it seems to have become a competition in caller lab of well this is how we do it caller lab writes the definitions we use the definitions the way they're written to teach our dancers how to dance by the definitions which is everywhere external even though it's changing slowly where there is English is not the predominant language that everybody speaks so you have to fix the definitions and you have to understand the definitions and then there's the migrate migrations of the definitions to well this is how we do it this is standard application which is different depending on what state you're in like uh, Texas and Oregon is very different than uh, New England as far as application definitions so what's standard in one place is not standard in another whereas if you go to Germany or Sweden or Russia standard applications are that's a published document by Caller Lab. This is translated. This is what's standard. So there's a lot of nuances there that really need to be thought out and adjusted right across the international scale with Caller Lab. I think it would be an excellent presentation or even two. And uh, if you want to tee that up, let me know. Uh, by all means, we'll put you in wherever. But there's always an open invitation for Caller Lab to come. I'll forward the message. Please do. Martin, you're looking incredibly thoughtful at the moment. I'm so tired, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's 1 a.m. and I'm trying to keep my, not, not due to the topic, but due to my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're just rambling and discussing here. You know, you, you don't have to feel obligated <laughs> to stay if you're falling asleep. Well, I'm thinking about maybe taking an opposite position, but I don't think uh, I'll have ahead. to. One of, no, no, one it's of, all okay. <laughs> I was going to make a presentation on what I call the 10th man, um, which I think is something that Caller Lab is very, very sorely lacking in its discussion and in its arbitration. Um, the Tenth Man concept is really, it's an Israeli Mossad intelligence concept. Um, but it's, now it's I'm been awake. In, it's, been <laughs> in existence, it's been in existence for thousands of years, well before everything else was in existence. And what it was, was you need an odd number committee. Usually nine is the optimum number to get the maximum amount of discussion on any topic. And you can present for or against, but those nine people are allowed to present their opinions they could all be in total agreement with one another but there's always a tenth man and that tenth man the purpose of that tenth man is to challenge whatever the decision is whether he agrees or disagrees with it the purpose is to challenge that decision look at contrary aspects look at different applications look at different reasonings why it will work why it won't work all these other kinds of things and put it back to the committee to get that argument out there that discussion of what is good and what is bad and that is probably one of the most important things that is lacking is that contrary debate uh, of somebody that is completely objective and separated from their personal opinion with the idea of say Mickey you, you say that square through is a 10 beat movement and I'm going to say no square through is a 12 beat music because it has to be a group of four beats it shouldn't change if you're in a static square or anything. Now, whether or not you're right or wrong, or if you say linear cycle is three parts and Bob says it's four parts, mm -hmm. I will take the position, no, it's a five part call and put an argument for it. Even though I could be completely wrong, I have to present that contrary opinion so that the discussion is forwarded yeah. and cemented. And that's, that's, that's a concept that really needs to happen with square dancing. I think we would have a lot less problems today if we actually took that approach. I don't know. I think we've all had dancers like that. Oh, yeah. I'm opposed to that. <laughs> yeah. I uh, what, what what does it help the square? What does the, the 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 discussion about definitions? What does that help the square dance community? Why why is caller lab doing that? Because some callers want to discuss it. So let yes. them discuss it. What We're what changing. we are lacking, what we are lacking is a vision. What square dance is to be we have a social media world and we, we spoke about larry ward before um mm -hmm. and uh, i've seen that uh, video on on youtube about uh, his clubs he was offering something i think it was not just uh, like bob said that he could 
uh, call right and left grand in a way that you could dance right and left grand all night long. There was also a, a something in his way in his clubs that made people wanted to go there. And today yeah. people are on, on Facebook, on social media, and, and if things happen, there is that social element is missing. And, and we need something that we can put out and say, this is what Square Dance uh, stands for. And all these discussions about this is a three-part call or four-part call, as long as there is the argument, uh, once my dancers dance it and they like it, it's okay. I mean, what are we discussing if that is an answer? That is true. A valid the answer. Thing, the yeah. thing about Larry Ward was square dancing was fun. The emphasis mm -hmm. was on fun. He made it exciting. That's another thing. When you danced to Larry Ward, dancing was exciting. Even if you did the same thing several times in a row or several nights, they didn't care if it changed every week. Uh, there was another caller here in the San Leandro area. Oh, his name was Jack Logan. Incredible singing voice. He had seven singing calls, seven patter records, and he used the same patter and the same singers for four years in a row. People knew. They said that once, once the needle hit the record, they knew the whole dance. They knew what was coming. And they showed up in droves. There was no because, boredom. Yeah. But because they, they, they part, showed up to dance with, with others. Yeah, but part I mean, when I listen to Larry was, Ward today, I, I don't, I, I listen to his calling, but it does not attract me the way that I look at the video that it attracts those dancers. And part of that yeah, falls into the category of dancer expectation, because what was expected was the activity, the interaction, the event, and the fun that surrounded. And Larry used it as a medium to promote that fun sociability and that atmosphere. And that's what the experience was, was the atmosphere of fun and the friendship, the interaction. And dancing was only the medium by which it was presented. Today, square dancing and dancer expectation on square dancing is very different than it was 50 years ago. And what we expect and what the dancers expect is often in conflict with when, when I say we, we as callers expect and what the dancers ex expect is often in conflict with one another. Uh, and you see this all the time. I think the greatest thing was, um, uh, Mickey, you told a story about callers that came over from the States, very good international callers calling at the high levels, doing all this, but you had to get employ local callers because they were booked in to call basic and mainstream dancers and were unable to deliver a basic and mainstream dance because their expectation as a caller was very different than what the dancer expectation was as a dancer. And that is part and parcel of what it is. Why we need a definitions committee, why we need to discuss these definitions, I think is an absolute necessity. Yes, we do, because there needs to be a certain standard of what this activity is going to be when you make a command, what is going to happen during that command that has to be standard. However, a lot of the discussions we have around definitions, um, I think the technical term of a lot of the caller lab discussions and a lot of the vocality on what should and shouldn't be falls into the technical part of pure crap. And that's really the best way to describe it because it is, and myself included in this, it is an opinion of what we think is right. And I very, very strongly promote that discussion because as Bob would say one thing, I might have a different opinion, Mickey would have a different opinion, Chris would have a, a different opinion. We need to have that discussion to come up with a, an agreement of what is best for the dancers. That's where I think a lot of these discussions on definitions has lost its way, is we're coming up with a discussion on what is best for the lawyer that presents the best argument for his or her calling. And the worst argument that I see is, well, at advanced or at challenge, this is this. So if we say that when we're talking recycle, oh, well, why do we have recycle at mainstream? And then we have to redefine it at advanced or A2. Well, that's because we did it wrong. So let's fix it. Let me you add know, something to those this. Those kinds of things. That's, that's just an example. I'm, I'm not using that as, as a discussion point. But it's one of those things. We have to have this standardization, this discussion of contrary opinions to come up with something that does 
what Larry and others were doing back then, they can go with it. Dancers can show up with an expectation of if the caller says right and left through, at this program level, we know what a right and left through is. How he uses it in the variation is not going to change. If a caller says recycle at mainstream, it's going to be done this way. How it's used and sequences are going to change, but that definition is based for the dancers to dance and have fun, not for the technicality of the caller to say, well, I can do a 17 sixteenths of a, of a recycle and this is the ending formation, because that's just stupidity. That's calling for callers. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah. I have to say that um, a strive theory that um, the discussion and, and, and the, the definition work is just one part we're doing in Color Lab. Um, mm -hmm. There's a big part. We also see um, how can we attract people and, and about the socializing is a big topic. I had a, um, a seminar in the last convention and we'll be hosting another one. I was asked to at the next convention. So there are things more to that than just working on the definitions. And um, it's always been different colors, different regions, and trying to find common ground. Just remember the starting of Color Lab when they tried to build the lists. And you had several calls, and the one caller wanted that call on the list, and the other one on that one. And new calls were invented and going through the process to find common ground. So I think it is important. And also, um, once we fix it, and you know, at that time, uh, we didn't have so many programs going up to C4. So now, mm -hmm. if we want to have a little consistency um, for those who would like to go into higher levels, uh, we got to make sure that you know we have a kind of a block system, building one by one, and to make sure that um, things we have in, in 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 the high level don't get dragged down all the way to the entry level which I think is the most mistake we can do. And I think therefore we need some guidelines for the callers. And in order to have it worldwide um, concept with an entry level where we all can dance together. And I think the togetherness is the most important thing in square dance. Uh, the togetherness, the socializing. And if we don't have that, yeah, if you cannot learn somewhere and go and dance everywhere, then we're breaking the hobby. We're breaking a selling point. Okay. Then everybody can just do what he ever wants. And then definitely we don't need definitions because everybody just can do his own soup. Right. Yeah. And uh, regarding the tent man, sometimes I get the feeling that we only have tent man. That's true. Well, the, the yeah. adage is if you put two callers in a room and ask for an opinion, you get five opinions and they're all different. So, there, yeah. there should be some positive, productive um, outcome. Absolutely. Of, of, uh, one, of, one of the things that I've noted on Color Lab, we, we talk about the social interaction, social and recruitment. I, I had a rather unique experience. I had seven different queries asking if this was me uh, from different research scientists quoting documents on teaching, on presentation, on choreography and various other aspects because we delve into different things and this came about because I had to register with the US Academia the University of Wollongong and also uh, in the US the um, editorial managers for uh, uh, plant and science management documentation and the publications the International Science Digest and plant because I, I co-authored a paper called invasive plant uh, sorry, in calling measuring the success of cross tenure collaboration or collaborative weed management with insights to co develop with practitioners on plant management. Now, that, that was a scientific paper de dealing with the metrics of collaborative weed management in New South Wales. Absolutely nothing to do with square dancing. But because I registered with this, they look up the name, and what's coming up is a lot of these sessions on the Orange County Callers website, there's things on teaching. And I've got more questions about square dancing and calling from non-square dancers registering with university research papers than I ever did uh, putting newspaper ads in or whatnot in, in the local paper on just what it's about. You know, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't got a dancer class. I, I admit that right now. I'm, I'm not currently calling for a club. I have not got a dancer class running right now. Still hoping. But when I look at that, I look at what you just said about the Caller Lab committees. We've given 
probably not less than 200 presentations on the life of square dancing, the sociability of square dancing, making it more fun, making it more attractive. But I've also noticed that our presentations are all to a room full of callers or all to a room of executives that run clubs at, at the local meeting and never outside. And they never seem to get outside because everyone's, oh, that's a great idea. There may be one or two things taken and we all go back to our standard thing. We isolate ourselves as much as we isolate, we prevent dancers from coming in. We don't recruit to anybody now, rarely, that has not got a background. There's very few younger dancers coming in than there used to be because we recruit to our friends, our dancers recruit to their friends, and as we've all got over 60, they've all got over 60, you'll land excluded in this. Uh, oh, come on, somebody else has got to raise their hand up in, 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 in argument there. Just, this, just this is, barely. This, this, is, this, is the kind, <laughs> this is the kind of thing we do. These are the kind of things that we need to have discussions on. These are the kinds of things that we need to have discussions when we talk about definitions. And I think it's absolutely necessary that we do have conflicting points of view, but we do it with respect so that we can actually come to a general consensus of what is agreeable or disagreeable. And I will like to stress, and Mickey has said this, and it's the definitions committee in the ARC has said this, this may not be considered proper to do something. That doesn't mean you can't do it. What it means is you don't do that in an open forum or without a workshop or without something to make it absolutely clear to the dancers what it is you're trying to do. Like Bob's double pass through swing your partner and you know, is that proper? Well, some will say yes, some will say no. I personally don't care. If he explains it to his dancers and his dancers are having fun with it and he does it as his club, he's doing it right because they're coming to dance to him and they're having fun. If Mickey gets a hundred dancers every year join his club and keep 70% of those dancers and but he calls right and left three with the girls turning the boy at basic well you know what he does that at his club he doesn't do it at open dance as far as I'm concerned he's doing something right and those are the expectations but the standards so the, are for the general community and that's why we need to have those discussions go ahead Martin so you are saying uh, I haven't been to Bob's club yet but I assume uh, we have 10 squares. They all do the double pass through, swing your partner. They do that. Now I visit from Germany. I, I enter the hall. I say, hi, Bob. This is Martin. I'm from Germany. Do you expect Bob to cut back all those things and say, okay, guys, unfortunately, we have Martin from Germany here tonight. Um, now we are limited to all those standard formations. Called no, it. Is that what you're I, saying? No, what I'm saying is part and parcel of calling is not double pass through swing your part and here part and parcel of calling. The, uh, how did I say? I, what does being, part and parcel being, mean? I'm I, sorry. I, uh, sorry. Let me let me try and explain. Being a caller means there's a lot of aspects of calling. Choreography and choreographic management is one of the smaller parts of calling. It's important because that's what the dancers see. But aspects such as judgment, being able to deliver, being able to apply all those techniques effectively for dancer success is much bigger than knowing where a swing ends, if it's defined or not defined. In this case, this is where caller judgment would come in. And hey, I've got Martin, Martin. Martin's coming in from Germany and, and Mickey's coming in from Germany and wanna welcome them to our club, great. Okay, now we're gonna bang, just a quick refresher. Do a double pass through everybody. Look at the person behind, beside you. That's your partner. Everybody, swing your partner. Okay, and he would tell us where he wants us to go after that. That quick walkthrough would clarify that for you in a second. That falls into the, the category of caller judgment. Even though his own club knows this, it's now clarified for you with a quick walkthrough. That's the skills and techniques of caller judgment. For him to call double pass through, swing your partner, and then call something that you don't expect, that's bad caller judgment because he set you up to fail. That's another aspect of caller training that needs to be discussed. And unfortunately, we as callers focus so much on choreography, we forget that choreography is really one of the smaller parts of being a caller. That's just the tool by which we deliver the message to the dancers. The message to the dancer is fun and success using what you know and adding that little bit of variety that you can succeed at that and build on what you know. How okay. can we expect? 
how can we expect a young caller, a beginner, to know all that? You can't. That's why we mentoring and teaching. I don't. I don't expect Yolanda to know all of this stuff. That's that's but why I, I, come I can to tell classes. you right now that in 2019, Yolanda was so <laughs> absolutely terrified because she was asked to call a tip at a dance that she spent what was it almost three and a half months writing sequences out, getting ready to call a tip at a dance. Now she doesn't even bat an eyelid. Eyelid. She'll spend two or three hours preparing an evening dance because well, she's worked with callers point. like Bob. She's worked, <laughs> she's attended sessions like this. She's learned those techniques over time. And that's what teaching and calling and mentoring is. And that's why these sessions are so important. I don't do a session for new callers. I do a session for new callers, journeyman callers, experienced callers, and people that are teaching callers because it has to fit into all those categories. Bob is about to have a heart attack or he's got his hand up, one of the two. Yes, and then I yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wanted to make a comment to Martin. It was about 35 years ago. I had an advanced club, and it was a weekend Sunday dance. And there was a couple of dancers showed up from Germany who were only plus dancers. So, like you say, I'm not going to change it to a plus dance, but I talked to them, and I explained quite bluntly, you can dance mainstream and plus better than these guys ever can ever thought of okay and what i'm going to do is i'm going to call and sometimes i'll use advanced calls and i'll separate so only the advanced dancers will do it and you'll be the outside couple watching or things like that or some things i'll be able to give you cues to tell you what to do and if you trust me you'll get through everything they got through the whole night and for the advanced dancers, they thought they had had an advanced dance. They didn't know any better. And they generally don't anyway. But I live choreography. I, I mean, I live it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, so yeah I do the that... same thing. I've got some groups where we have permanently new people show up. So usually I put them either on site or head position. So with the experienced dancers, they get their share. Uh, in there, I usually do some mainstream calls and, and, and difficult stuff to get them to the corner, and then we all have boxes. I do not use the, the, the beginner stuff, so and they like it, and somehow the others learn also by by watching and being involved. Okay, yes. they don't need to be scared off, but you know, um, but you got to make sure that, that you know the new ones are all on one spot, either heads or sides, and uh, even works in the singing call if you watch your sequence status, right? Now, I can guarantee you that if you've ever gone to a caller school or if you've ever done caller training or, or this kind of stuff in one of those fixed formats, you learned positions of the square. You learned how to resolve a square. You learned a technique for a two-face line resolution or a box resolution. You learned about choreographic management. You learned boy, girl, girl, boy sequencing. You learned to call using a restricted number of calls or taking calls away, and you were analyzed on your performance. But chances are you got a 30 second presentation and judging how the dancers are able to dance, you have to be able to adjust to them. Let's move on to the next topic. And that was it that you got on that. Unfortunately, those are the biggest aspects of calling and teaching and learning to call and to mentoring other callers that tend to get over skip because chore choreography, yes, it's absolutely critical, but it is not the focus of where we should put, be putting our effort. Our effort should be always focused on the dancer's success, the dancer's fun, the dancer's having a good time, and choreography is just one of those means. It's as important as music we use, it's important as how we use our voice, it's as important as the music, it's important as using proper judgment for the floor. It's not the be-all, end-all, but it's what we tend to focus on. I'm going to go to Yolanda first because she's had her hand up a couple of times now. So um, one of the things, believe it or not, is that I have new new callers asking me for advice these days. <laughs> I'm entering. I know that's really scary. I know, Chris, you're just cringing. Um, so um, your ghost ghost writing choreo. <laughs> <laughs> but I I talk about things like, um, you know, um, how to do an equivalent for a square through four, and and how do you put that into a singer, and 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 things like that, right? It it um, so. And then 
And because they're too afraid to go to a regular caller because they, you know, they sort of put the callers on pedestals and they won't, they're, they're, you guys, they're just not going to talk to you guys <laughs> yet. <laughs> You know better. So, um, but I mean, like for, for my homework last week, because I have, to, I'm in several groups, so I have to do a new song every week. So my, um, my opener had to be changed from mainstream to SSD. My figure had to have several equivalents in it. Like, so one of them was like a square through four. So I had it leads right and touch a quarter. Um, I have a theme that I have to do every week, and the lyrics have to reflect that. So the theme was peanut butter. <laughs> have fun with that one. Then I had to to change the figure from a progressive to a non-progressive, and, and and stuff. So then I'm in one of Daryl's classes, and we're working on formation to formation. So then I rip my uh, singer figure apart so that I know all the formations that I go into. I could not have done that if i hadn't been in mel's classes and and asking bob for feedback and i'm in daryl's class and and i'm working on formation to formation development with steve <laughs> you know and in emails and stuff like that if if i wasn't putting that all together i wouldn't be getting i'm doing it at my rate not at how, how anybody else is doing it um but i didn't even i hadn't a clue what you guys were talking about when i first started I know. I remember. I have a question to Jolanda. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of a regular caller? Or put it the other way, what do you do when you call? You call, right? And the dancers move. Yeah. So but, you're but, a caller too. You're just but, a caller like like we are. Yes, but the but from the I am talking about the real e either yes real, or but. but so these are these are I these are um i'm going to interrupt you there for a second yolanda because mm -hmm. Mickey, your question is so absolutely important but i'm going to take the term caller out of that and take dancer because this is what we as callers tend to forget it's all about perception and perception is reality how yeah. one person perceives something is their reality when yolanda came to me the first time it's Ooh, I'm, I'm scared oh, was, to ask I a was... question. Okay, I don't consider it like if, if we talk choreography, I'll say Mickey, I'll, I'll bow to you every time on choreographic sequencing and, and the same with Bob on various things. I consider myself a, a good solid tradesman caller. I'm, I'm, I've called internationally. I like believe I can give a good dance. Uh, John, you've heard me dance. If you uh, heard me call, a few others have heard me call. I don't consider myself at that level, but that's my own perception of my own ability because I'm very hard on myself. Yolanda is even worse. What's an international caller? What's a regular caller? What's what's a club caller? A caller that calls for a club. Does that mean they have a certain skill level? No. It's all a matter of perception and how we perceive ourselves and how dancers perceive us is what we have to focus on. Not on our perception of how good am I because I don't care who you are. There's always room to get better. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I thought that was a great question. Yeah, well, what I'm, I'm saying, you know, no matter where I call or what I do, and I hope dancers like it and and and, and callers like and in the coaching, whatever. But I would just consider myself a caller, you know. And and if Yolanda, she started calling, she was a beginner caller, and she moves the dancers around, she's a caller as well. Point. Period. I I, yeah. I have to interrupt for a second here, uh, just to in, in case it wasn't totally clear. Uh, some words that came out of Mel's uh, mouth um, uh, when he said, blah, 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 and Yolanda is even worse than I am. He, what he was trying to say is in terms of being hard on yourself, <laughs> not, yeah. not, not, no, not your but, skill but, level. But the thing no, is, I, what I said when, was her perception, and, and, yeah. and you're absolutely correct. Perception is reality. The, the thing is, the perception uh, from some of the newer callers that I got. Um, because I was on Mel's earlier classes, and once I got past the don't ask a question part, I had overwhelming amounts of questions. <laughs> and some of these people have gone to to the very beginning from the OC uh, caller sessions. And so they're seeing me ask all these questions. And so instead of asking Mel the questions, they will ask me the questions because 
they saw me asking the questions and so they're more comfortable asking me and i and also i've gotten um questions now yeah but yolanda i think part of that is also that you're not exactly willing to spend 11 hours answering questions after a session <laughs> <I> was. <laughs> that was only the well, first one <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but I mean, I've had, I've had cures come to me that have been queuing for years. And then they said, now I'm thinking about becoming a caller. So what, what you're still newer at this. So can you give me the basics? Can you still remember what it's like to be at the very, very beginning and, and so they they do ask me good and I've, I've got a couple of dancers that have been turned into beginner callers now and and i'm working with them and so um that's, that's, that's and fantastic. because mel said whatever you do pass it forward so that's what i've been doing now do i do it well well probably not but i i am i'm more likely to do it from the ladies caller so i, I tend to get the lady callers asking me questions and several people have said to me, you, one of the ladies actually for my Christmas um, present at the end of one of the meetings said to me, Yolanda, if you hadn't been asked answering my questions, I would have quit. So I am still, and now that lady has, has got two new callers that I am also working with. So because that lady stayed with it, now we I'm working with three different yeah. ones. So Orlando, it's have working. A look, have a look at the screen and the people on the screen. And I can guarantee you that if you sent an email to any one of them, they would all be more than willing to assist or take the time yeah. to have sessions with you and everything else. Martin, you had your hand up. You're volunteering. You're really volunteering. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wanted Martin, to tell Martin, you, Landa, don't Martin call says, me. Call him anytime, <laughs> just make sure it's after 1 a.m. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. Yes. Um, but I mean, that's well, the first of all. Between... Hang on, Yolanda. Mark, go ahead, yeah. Martin. Good. Well, Yolanda, do you call for a club on a regular basis? Um, I guest call on a regular basis. You, you guest call. Zoom, on Zoom and on the You floor. get paid for that? No. Why is that? Because I'm a guest caller. I'm still learning. Okay. Do the other callers that are asking you questions? do they call for a club regularly um they're guest callers as well yes. okay there's the problem guys um we have an activity where we invite let's say newbies young callers Oops. we invite them to pick up a microphone we invite them to pay a lot of money for music we invite them to invest um we set up a, a curriculum for them, which is a jungle of, of, of things <laughs> to learn. And um, we have a stage where we work on. We're not just sitting at a desk. So we're, ex we're exposing them to, to people. Um, we are not an eco, uh, a newbie friendly activity. Why, why should somebody start calling? I mean, of, he's losing. You're absolutely right. Um, for a lot of new callers, we're, we're stuck in a tradition. If you're a guest caller, you do a tip. That is a courtesy that a caller there is doing for you. Would you like to call a tip? They don't generally pay for it. But Yolanda, you're in a position right now, especially in your area. I think you've got two new callers in your area uh, specifically that you could actually get together and put a dance together and do or travel to a reasonable area and do a dance. As far as getting paid for that, do you want to pay them as callers? No, because that changes the parameters of their status depending on where you are in the world. But one of the things that I had a lot of success uh, with when I was mentoring callers is I would put dances together. It would be a paid dance. All of that funding would go into their education or it would be spread out to them to purchase new records or to do something that it wasn't a taxable income. It was a, a learning investment that it, it wasn't that. When you get to that point, that's just, just one of the, there's lots of ways around that, but it is something, and I agree with you, Martin, but it is something you have to be very cautious of. We are not a new caller, the same as we're not a new dancer friendly, new dancer, not so much, but new caller friendly organization, unless we mentor callers to develop their own skills to create this and we support them in the creation of becoming <coughs> professional, in other words, getting paid to do something. 
and we don't go down that road often enough. Go ahead, Martin. Every time I listen uh, to these sessions, I listen to myself, I go to the ECTA convention. I'm not blaming others. I mean, here, it's my own nose. Um, I, I always have a feeling that, of course, someone wants to pass on knowledge, but it's also a, a tip they're calling. They're also presenting themselves. So my, my question is, I'm a club caller for a club. Uh, the numbers of, of club members is increasing. We are now up to 100 members. We have five, six squares every, every club night. And I spoke to the board and I said, we have a problem. And they said, what kind of problem do we have? And I said, well, I'm 50 years old. I want to do this as long as I can, but there will be a time where, we, where I'll have to stop. Uh, we have to find a caller that is, that is building up. And there was a young boy in the club and I said he's going to do it and I asked him and he said yes he volunteered and then I went to the club and I said and you have to pay him from the day one on and they said why and I said because I don't want him to illegally copy music I want him to pay for it I want him to invest and it's an investment for the club and and it's it's a, a mindset that I'm talking about uh, once we have a club once we have something we have to build the future we are not building the future at the moment we are discussing stuff but we're not building and a future you're, you're in a very good position to do that I know when I was calling for the Schwarzwald Tanzers I did the same thing um, I became the treasurer of the club and uh, Norm Lafay became the president of the club and between the two of us we arranged that the investment was into the club so the licensing, the music, everything else was for the club. That was paid for by the club. The purchase of the equipment was for the club. It was for the use, as I had mine, for any new callers that were developing could use that equipment. They could practice with it. They could deal with it. And that was the investment for development. Um, clubs that have that kind of a structure, uh, the Spin Chainers in Ottawa, when it was running, uh, was one of those. And they had basic mainstream plus, and they mentored through that system, even though they had one caller was teaching new callers. Um, Alan Kerr, uh, Raymond Bates was in here earlier, does the same thing as the investment in new callers and his new callers are actually working, they either call the dance or they'll be the instructors for the new dancer class under his auspices on a separate night or even on the same night in a different hall. And they work those kinds of things as a development investment of new callers, whether paid or not, it's only going to work if they feel that their time and energy, if I wanna commit to being a caller, I'm talking of about a five-year investment into learning the base principles on average, plus a 20 to 30 year investment of time in an activity. And that is something that's like, if you, you're gonna to go to university, you're gonna to pay to get your degree, but you expect to get paid once you get your degree. And this is what scholarships, this is what payment, this is what investment, calling is different because there is no reward for calling other than that personal reward and if you're lucky enough you can make money at it most people aren't but it should be able to pay for itself in some way or form i envy you martin because your club is in a very unique position to be able to do that i also pity you because you're in a very unenviable position to try and get people that are fixed in their mindset to say "Ooh, that ten dollars a night or that thirty dollars a night that we're going to pay this guy to learn Oh, that's money out of our pockets that we're never going to use anyway. You know, we've got 50,000 marks in our, our kitty or 50,000. Do you guys use marks still or all euros? I don't know. But we've got this <laughs> in our kitty, but we're never going to use it because we've got to have a healthy bank account rather than invest in our future for longevity. It's, it's a difficult situation. Mickey. Yeah, on one way, I agree with Martin. On the other way, I think at the beginning, you have to invest on, on your own if it's a hobby type thing. But also some of my clubs, they had um, sponsored like color schools for the for the new callers. They've yeah. paid the the fee for the color schools. Um, another club um, bought the equipment, and the caller and gave the equipment to the new caller. But he had to um, call for it, right? So he earned it through his calling. So this is another way of um, paying credit to uh, what is done and investing to the future. But um, still. It is also not only taking, but also uh, in investing from, from the caller side, right? It's not a one-way street. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, and one of the things is the, some of the new callers are being told now, don't start because the amount of investment that you have to put into this hobby or whatever, um, 
you know, how many, how many years do we still have left? Right. It's not, um, and so that's one of the things that I'm trying to say to people, well, let's just enjoy it. Let's see how long it lasts. Put right? it, put him on drugs as soon as you can. That's what I did with my guy. <laughs> Yeah, but, I, I mean, mean I, that's I, the hard part is getting. I always you love know, them that to question. Start. How long? How long do we have left with square dancing? Well, I like heard my, in the seventies they were talking about my, that already. My so. wife is not a square dancer, and she has absolutely no desire for square dancing. And I don't blame her because of the way she was treated when she went to mm -hmm. her first dance. If if anything can put anybody, especially somebody that's relatively young in their their forties, and put them off square dancing, it's other square dancers. Mm -hmm and how they treat people that are non-square dancers and how she was treated as well as the age differentiation and all that other kind of stuff that's why we're dying we do we do not well, make square dancing an activity but I, as to your question how long is it going to last that's entirely up to you yeah. if you create an activity that people want to come to and is fun and they want to have a good time doing it you're going to last forever if you don't make it that way you're dead before you start i i'm glad that i started dancing in the 70s and 80s because it was a different way of dancing you know there was so much enthusiasm about things um everybody was happy um and, and stuff like that there wasn't a conflict going on and and so that that gave me a whole different perspective of it right. the sad part about that time although that was the heyday yeah. it was also the transition to elitism i call it that was where we started branching out into oh come to plus it's the fun level we've got to get up there and and as we we progressed as dancers up those levels some of us maintain yeah it's fun at every level but others we had also at that time the heyday of being a caller was a status symbol for the sake of being called a caller regardless of ability and we had a lot of callers that were there that started they could not call because they didn't have the fundamental principles or the leadership or the training to be callers. And they found it easier to say, well, if I can call plus, I'm a better caller than a basic caller or a mainstream caller. And if I could call advanced at that time, wow, I'm a great caller. I can call internationally now because I'm a really, really good caller. Unfortunately, they didn't have the foundations. And we had a lot of callers that did a lot of damage to the activity because of that. And unfortunately, the damage wasn't them and their calling. The damage was they brought their dancers up to where they were comfortable calling rather than calling to where the dancers were comfortable dancing and let them build that at their own speed where they would want to recruit. Because once they started dancing plus and advanced, well, there's no time to go back and do a basic course. Now, now we all know those stories. What do we learn from them for the future? Is there anything we can learn from it? I'm tired of listening to those stories. It's yeah. not a personal thing. It's, oh, it's no, no. just... You're, you're, abs you're absolutely correct. What we can learn from it, in my opinion, is to close the book on those stories. Turn around. That it, acknowledge that it happened and say, right, here's a blank canvas. We have a blank canvas with an activity that can be fun. Let's make it fun and let's open the door and change the whole perception. Square dancing is not a senior's activity. It is not a senior's activity. <laughs> it is not a young dancer's activity. It's so it's a middle age. It's an activity that anybody can enjoy, but we we lost that perspective. Yeah. Right. We have I mean, I, I was literally no, told by I was literally told by somebody I was going to go to a jamboree, and somebody said, "Oh, you're too young to go to the jamboree. Don't go." <laughs> I thought, "What the heck?" You know. <laughs> my grand, my grandfather used to say, "People are just critters." And he taught me that when I was about four. It took me a long time to learn what he meant, and that was. Every animal has its nature. And if you take the time to understand the nature of the animal and respect it, it will respect you for its for your nature. Now that doesn't mean if you've got looking at a scorpion that it's not gonna sting you, or if you're looking at a lion, it's not gonna eat you. But if you understand its nature and you respect its nature, you're going to be able to deal with it. It will respect you for yours. It's not going to change, but you can interact effectively if you understand the nature. We as square dancers and square dance callers do not understand the nature of our dancers for the most part. And that is they want to have fun. We want them we want to give them the best fun that we can, but we only judge it from our perspective in, in most cases. Not not everybody. This is a big generalization. And you asked, what can we learn from that? Well, we can learn that that is history. 
history belongs in the past. We have a good solid foundation activity that we can build on, we can develop. We can take that into the future if we look at it as new. Get rid of all that crap, learn from it, but get rid of it. Every but what's the crap? Up, all the crap is, well, back in the 70s, we used to do this. You remember this caller? He used to do this. He only called that then. It was so much fun. Yeah, well, that's because it was a different audience, a different thing. We don't have. Every time you start a class, it's a brand new book. It's a different audience. Yeah. The only thing May that, I step the in here? Thing that's consistent is, is what we're doing. Go ahead. I would even go a step further than Martin did it. And taking a look at um, the people here and how long they've been in the activity and about the times of the past we're talking. And Jolanda just said that she's been in there for quite a while until she stopped. So we all know what it was like when we thought it was good and nice and fun and booming and the hay. So we were there. Let's just do it the way it was done that time. And it was the fun, the socializing, and I mean, I, we didn't have as many le levels, but it doesn't matter. I have a philosophy of togetherness and socializing. I had a, a C2 and C1 dance going seven hours today. I like every level, but the most of all, they still socialize, which yeah. is not common in those high levels. Okay. And they still laugh. They chat with each other. They care for each other. And it's us, the leaders, we have to bring that back. And if we provide the fun and, 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 and put the emphasis on the socializing, you know, Jim Mayo once had a color school over here and he said, show me your dancers, how they dress, and I tell you who's the color. And, and we can be, we are that, you know, if, if we provide fun, if we're a fun person, entertaining, if we are persons who care, Okay, we will get those people who do the same thing. If they don't feel comfortable with a person who cares and entertains, they will leave anyway. Well, then okay? you're also if, if everybody is dressed up in black and white because they like it, and one comes in with the red clothes, he's not going to feel comfy. He's going to leave. So we're setting the tone as leaders, and we have to get back setting the tone. And there is no excuse because we know what we liked before. And you know what? You just re-emphasized one of the last points I put in my session. What is one of the key things to being an effective leader? Is you have to be a follower. You have to follow the needs, wants, and desires of the people that you're there to entertain. In order to lead them properly, you have to be able to follow along with what they need, what their abilities are, what they want, and what they want to achieve. And not what and, want. and can I make a comment too, in my opinion? Of um, so, um, I think it's necessary. I've been around a lot of jamborees and and because of Zoom, talk to other people, and what they're do quite often what they're doing now is they get a, a reduction in the fees of the halls and stuff like that if they get if they can rent so many motel or ro hotel rooms you know like they can you know, they get a discount mm -hmm. for that. So what's happening now, you know, in this we were talking about the seventies and eighties, we used to billet people right and stuff and now we're I, there's places and they won't give the information for billeting unless they've filled up a floor or two of motel or hotel rooms so now we're making it that square dancing is only for the people who have money instead of how can we accommodate this for people who don't you know um, not everybody, I mean, with the price of gas and stuff these days, some people can't go to a lot of jamborees and stuff like that if they have to pay for expensive expenses like motels and hotels. But well, we're dealing with a lot of extra safer. problems, right? Yeah. Like inflation, uh, higher gas rates, um, or people that are health out of problems, COVID, like as, people with as masks. As much as I or, hate to or, say it. No, we're not. And I say that very, very realistic. I'm not saying that tongue in cheek. In the 1980s, inflation was very high. The cost of living was high and the amount of salary was low. 
It's comparable today with the same inflation rates, but the salaries are higher. The difference is if you have an activity that you want to do, you make time to do it. Square dancing is no more expensive, and actually it's a lot less expensive than curling. It's a lot less expensive than bowling. It's a lot less expensive than darts. But all of those clubs which have negligible activity have something that square dancing has not got, and that is they make it a social interactive fun festival thing that people want to do. They'll get dressed up for a big event. They'll dress how they want for normal everyday things. They have leagues. I was part of an archery club. Every week you get all the same people. They're absolutely dedicated to go out there. A, a, a standard longbow costs about $1,500, and the way I shoot, it usually costs me about another $100 every two weeks just to buy arrows because I'm constantly breaking them. <laughs> and, and, you know, plus I pay the $10 fee every week to just go shoot three arrows at a target. Now, that's an expensive hobby. Yet if it's something you enjoy, you go, you find the time, you make the time. Square dancing yes. hasn't changed. What's changed is the way we do it. And we've made it so that it is not an activity that people want to make time for. And I say that in all seriousness. When people have an activity that they have fun, they have a good time, and they're getting together and they look forward to meeting these people every week and they want to do this and they want to share an activity and a commonality of that activity through square dancing, they'll make the time for it. If there's a big jamboree coming up, they'll make the time for it. They'll make so what we're talking about is we will do this all the time. We won't go to everything, but shooting, we will go to what we can. Shooting arrows is, is like an individual type thing, just like go darting. But meeting is the socializing part again and making a habit and an event out of it. Now, we used to be socializing, and usually you say that the tougher and rougher the times are, the people more looking for socializing events. Like thinking about in the, in the 80s, we had big bowling alleys. Uh, in Germany was the Kegel clubs. They all went down. When those individual sportings came up, uh, be it mountain biking and 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 whatever, hiking and 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 um whatever pilates and and all that stuff and 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 fitness uh workouts and and, and stuff like that so in squirtles to me it seemed to be like developed into an individual sporting type even though we're moving with people and trying you know especially with the technical elements uh or at least with your partner maybe but it's not so much more the socializing i think that is the key point if we can make it an event again Mm -hmm. club-wise, special type thing. Um, and the, the success with special dances we've seen it over here in Germany, um, like either part of rodeo or even now the Christmas dance, which just happened uh, in, in Dillingen, then it is a success and people come and show up because they like it, they're looking for it. Um, and maybe that's the message we have to spread. I'm, I'm in an unusual area in that the nearest square dance club to me is... 380 kilometers away. Wow. That's the that's the nearest club to me. You know, and whenever I get a chance to go, I go. Whenever they have dances nearby, because they actually have a, a thing called a halfway dance here, uh, which is in a town that doesn't even have, it's got one square dancer that lives in the town. And when she dances, she travels down to Melbourne, which is almost 460 kilometers away, to go square dancing. She makes the time to do that. She subsequently moved to Melbourne, but they still have that dance every year in a town that has got no square dancing whatsoever. People in the area going, you live, Mel, in, how many people do you have in, in your area? Uh, the town I'm moving into is a very small town, but I live into two joint cities. There was a square dance club here. They didn't have a caller. I was going to take over the club and expand it when I moved here. Unfortunately, internal club politics of what square dancing should be what they wanted to do with no caller and a, a guy that only had tapes and records that he bought off his own to keep people dancing and try and teach them um, became a political bickering and the club didn't shatter or fall apart it exploded because of personality conflicts unfortunately that's something that i'm fighting against and hopefully that happened outside they... germany yeah <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it happens everywhere, but hopefully, like, I'm, yeah. I'm building a house in Jindera, and I'm hoping to start a group there, and it's just going to be that. I got asked, you know, we talk about funding. Um, I've been doing these. This is now, believe it or not, uh, this is session 
what do we got? Four, four times three is 12 and 30. So this is session 150 today that, that we've done just here and never charged for it. People have asked, well, why don't you charge a fee for this? Why? Because I'm not doing this as a chargeable fee. I'm not doing this uh, for that. I will, however, say that there are some people that are doing this, similar to me, that are getting grouped together to mentor. There's other callers out there that are doing one-on-one -on -one sessions or group sessions or training sessions like Don Beck or uh, Tom Miller and whatnot that are absolutely fantastic. They charge $10 an hour for their sessions just on a one-on-one. -on -one. Um, take advantage of what is out there. But for just going back to where all, all of this started, um, Martin, you've got a group and you, you get together with your group periodically and you, you host a dance for new callers, spe specifically for the new callers. You've got a group that is able to do that and from that you can cherry pick and you can put things forward and you've got a very supportive organization with ECTA as far as I remember and as far as I know that they support that kind of activities, at least in, in what I've read. It's rather the caller drive suit. <laughs> yeah. Yolanda, you've got a group where you've only got a couple of callers in your area, but as you go down towards Vancouver, towards Trail, to, you know, up towards Fort St. John in that area, that's a long distance driving thing, but you could easily get together and use Prince George as a focal point to run a whole region event. Uh, you wouldn't do it often, but you could easily run a caller school and get your dancers in that area to support that, host it, build the money up so that it sustains itself. It's not going to be paid, but after a while you can do this for whatever and have that become an event in your area to substantially foment the development of new callers, hence the development of new dancers, and change that whole perspective. But going back to what Martin says, we've had this discussion almost every session of what it was in the 50s and there's the 50s oh it was the heyday but in the 60s it started going down and in the 60s it was fantastic but in the 70s it started going down in the 70s and 80s it was fantastic but then it started going down because of elitism every decade has their own story of that well it's time to say history is history that's what was from that we take what was good which is what we have as an activity and we close the book on what was, and we say, what can we do now to make this what we want it to be? And what we want it to be is gonna be different for Bob, different for Bob, uh, Martin, different for Yolanda, different for Michael, or me, or Steven, or anybody else, but the consistency is going to be the material that we're using, i.e. the square dance programs. We just have to learn how to use it and present it so that they have that fun and that social activity, that social interaction that makes them wanna say, God damn it, I had a really good time on that. I want to do that more. I want to bring my friends, regardless of whether they're six or 96. Yeah. I'm just saying, I, I am a, a real ad, advocate for anti-poverty, you know, and, and, um, and I think if we can, if we can find ways so that everybody can participate in square dancing, yeah. um, you know that needs to be respected too. that's pro, pro that's pro poverty you want everybody to be able to do it yeah okay Great. not everybody can if you drop it to the level that everybody can well the caller has to call for free basically no 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 no, no. And the i am people not saying who rent the hall have to no. call for free no i am and saying and the public has to get public transportation the, yeah, the, the there, thing there is, is all there is all that hang on a second Yolanda. there is all that involved in it which is absolutely true but if we look uh, there was some excellent presentations done on the statistics of calling and I've, I've used these on average in our heyday if you will we would get a hundred dancers on the floor or 120 dancers on the floor and we end up with four squares of new dancers all the time that meant about 70 percent of the people that came in interested to square dancing we got rid of but because the numbers were so high, it was such a great activity. We still have that 30% retention rate, but now if we get 10 dancers, we keep three and seven dancers leave because, and they leave with a bad opinion. This is not everybody can or everybody can't. Now, I'm gonna be talking about this in other sessions as well, but I'm a firm believer that everybody can square dance. 
saying that everybody can't. No, everybody cannot square dance with the same capability, learn at the same speed, learn all this at the same pace that everybody else can. But everybody can square dance, just like every caller can do a singing call. Every caller can sing. It may not be as good as somebody else, and they may not learn as fast, but everybody can. The problem with them not doing it is not the dancers. It's not the new dancers. It's not the new callers. It's us. We're the ones that create these problems by setting these artificial goals and limits on what fun is supposed to be. Fun has to be achieved in 12 weeks with SSD or you fail. That's, we set you that. You put up. a lot of pressure on me, man. We, we, we create that perspective. Now, Bob, I know you don't do this. You like to have your dancers come in the floor and have a good time, regardless. And if it takes you 30 weeks to learn an SSD program, but they're having a good time, you're going to take 30 weeks to do it because your mm -hmm. emphasis on the dancers. Unfortunately, Jerry Story said this can be done in 12 weeks. Yes, Jerry Story could do it in 12 weeks, but most callers have found they can't do SSD in 12 weeks. It's taking them at least 16 weeks, sometimes 20 weeks. The, the callers that are, know how to use it are using 16 and 20 weeks and then Question giving them so now. others are failing. How long does it take to teach the basic program? How long is a piece of string? Okay, how, yeah, or mainstream. What's the recommendation for mainstream? Uh, okay, I'm going, to answer this. I'm, I'm going to answer this one differently. In 1978, the recommendation for basic was 80 hours plus 40 hours of teaching instruction time for the mainstream program. In 1981, it was 86 hours for both basic and mainstream. That's instructional time. So convert then that to weeks. Convert that uh, to week. 40 weeks. 40 weeks. That was I, what I was familiar with. Okay. And that's what we... It depends. We, however, that's 40 weeks based on a two and a half hour dance night. Yeah. When the program exactly. was... When the now program it's a two hour designed. dance night. Now, so it's closer, it would be closer to 50 weeks. That's and right. we but should track also, how many calls off. What I'm, you what know, I'm saying, Bob, Bob, you've got to let me finish answering your, your first question. Now, in a lot of places, introduction to square dancing through plus is 25 weeks. Yeah. Depending, depending on where you live. SSD program is 12 weeks. The basic program is recommended at 30 weeks or X number of hours of dancing instruction, I believe. I haven't, haven't looked up. But those are the recommendations. But the reality right. is your question was, how long does it take to teach the basic program? Sure. Sometimes 30. two years, sometimes okay. 20 weeks. It no. depends on the dancers, and we have to do it for the dancers, not for the callers. We'll take the basic, or the main, what is a basic program recommended 30 weeks. We subtract a couple, two calls and add 12, and we got SSD, which is more calls than the basic program, and we no, expected to teach it in less than half the time. No, we don't. Because if, if you're taking that approach, then you that's not, that's sorry. Yes, you're right. That's the way people are approaching SSD. But SSD was not designed to teach um, left, sorry, it was designed to teach left square through. Let's say recycle as an example. It was not designed to teach recycle from left hand waves or from half sachet waves within that 12 week period. It was not designed to teach flutter wheel and reverse flutter wheel from half sachet positions. It was designed to work from the standard applications within that 12-week program on a limited number of parameters. That well, was the 12-week okay. introduction, but it was also designed that after you've done that and you finished that standard introduction, you're expected to continue to dance to learn the rest of it. Well, and my point is that dance. the average caller took 30 weeks and never taught those variations you're talking about. Yep. That's the reality of the life. Chris is and not in his head. Yeah, he's seen that. Absolutely. They took 30 and weeks then, to teach a, a, a vanilla bland uh, out, uh, main, or mainstream or, or basic program. And now those same callers who took 30 weeks to teach that vanilla that's in the SSD have to teach it in 12. That's yeah. the reality. That's what now, life I, is I can about. also tell you that depending on where you go, uh, basic and mainstream was taught in 40 weeks 
two and a half hours a night. And it was done from multiple positions, from standard and non-standard positions, to graduation where you could call heads past the ocean, extend center's trade, single hinge, center's trade, recycle, and dancers would not break down. Didn't matter if they were half sashayed, same sex, whatever, doing this kind of stuff. A lot of that is not the program. That's the teacher's ability. That's the dancer's ability, the willingness to come in and, and do it and giving them a, something to do that they actually have fun and doing what they want to do and learning depending on where you are. The limitations that we put on our dancers, I have seen so many callers say, oh, well, it's because they're old, I have to give them 20 beats of music to do a square through. And we teach them like that. Oh, I've got to dumb this down because my dancers are stupid. Dancers are not stupid and dancers are not slow. We have callers that put these false expectations on what we believe the dancers can do rather than what they can do. Now, granted, there are some limitations on some people that you have to cater for, but we broadly generalize that to dancers. I remember, well, I, the, I remember the arguments of you want to do basic and mainstream in one year, it can't be done. It's two years minimum, and then you got two years of dancing before you learn it. Well, guess what? History, that was in the past. We need to fix what is now. And if it takes me two years to dance basic and my dancers are coming and having fun, I'll take two years to dance basic. Just an information for the discussion. Um, Colalip recommends 44 hours, that means 22 days for the basic, and 15 hours for the mainstream program. So altogether, that makes about 30 nights uh, regarding two hours. So altogether, 60 hours for basic and mainstream. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, Martin's got his hand up, and then Bob's got his hand up. I have an, a, a 19 year old son and a 17 year old daughter. I hope they don't hear what I'm saying now. Um, they want to be challenged. Yep. They don't. They yeah. don't want to work. They don't meet any expect, but they want to be challenged. If we have an everyday uh, hobby nobody's challenged, no special criteria, whatever. We are not, we don't attract those young people. You know, they, they don't want to meet the expectations, but they want to feel uh, expect. I, I don't know if I can word it correctly. Yeah, I know I'm exactly what you're saying. There's a difference be, there is a difference between the perception of being challenged with variety and actually being challenged with complexity of choreography. And there has to always be a feeling of success. I'm, I'm going to talk about that in one of the one of the future sessions. But the variety of people, as I said in that session, not everybody likes to be challenged all the time, but everybody likes to dance and feel like they're succeeding with a challenge. That's that's quite a bit of difference in that. And if you can present that effectively, you can meet both of those criteria at the same time. From day one, you can you from, can do that in the open one. house. They are a, a square dancer in the open house. And from that moment on, it's what the group, what the social group is thinking about teaching, progress, uh, whatever. If that group does not want to learn new calls, don't teach new calls. And the dancers that enter that group don't want to learn new calls. If you have a group that is willing to learn, that is that, that tells them this is what we like. They don't feel like we are not knowing something, but they feel like everybody here is to Absolutely. learn and that group will progress. And that's how you do it. If you do like uh, just using your example, if I do, I've, I've got my first night, everybody's there and I've got uh, ladies in men's sachet. I've taught roll away. I've taught circle left. I've taught Alaman left. I've taught right and left grand. I've taught swing your partner and promenade. I'm not doing corner progressions, but they understand corner. You can get that element or that feeling of challenge. You know, circle left, ladies in the men's sachet. <gasps> I've now got, who have I got? Oh my God, I've got my corner as my partner. Now what am I gonna, roll away, roll away. I've now got my partner as my corner. They understand that concept. If I called Alaman left new corner, it's my original partner. If I call swing your original partner, it feels different than swing your corner even though it is your original partner. Just the way we word and we present things will give a perception of that complexity that can add that challenge to me. And that's a very, very simplistic example. But this is how we do it. 
in a lot of cases to allow dancers that are having a little bit of trouble to catch up. They catch the nuances, but they're understanding what, what is expected of them. And dancers with a little bit of desire for that variety and complexity get the feeling of, I'm thinking of something, it's a little bit different in this presentation, I had to tune on and think differently. They're thinking two or three beats ahead, but they're still getting that complexity of the mental challenge. Those are the dancers what... that are going to experience things a lot faster. Those are dancers that may learn basic and mainstream in 12 weeks because they read the book and go out to a dance and be able to dance effectively. Those are also about the five to 10 maximum percentile of dancers that are on the dance floor. And if we cater as we have been for that 30%, we lose that 70%. Personally, I'd rather keep the 70% and lose the 30% because we're going to lose 30 anyway. Make them the, the elitists. Let people want to come and have fun because chances are they're going to come back and have fun with people because they'll realize that yeah, it may, may not have been as complex as it was, but I was having a good time socializing with these yeah. people. And they may come some of the time, not all of the time. And if we can flip that on its head, then we've got a new open book. Does that kind of deal with what you were saying there, Martin? Mm, yes. But I want to add that culture is nothing that you can... Uh, uh, you cannot say this is our new culture, but culture yeah, is absolutely. what you're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Culture has to be respected. But, yeah. But, so and, when but, Mickey but and I fully, cultural I fully agree with Mickey about the socializing aspect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but what is the socializing yeah. aspect? The what culture, kind of social culture. group are we? You know, that's what we have to okay. define. So the culture so, of complexity in dancing is a false culture that was created by callers not by dancers. So no, the I, social I, the social thing is what Yolanda is saying. The yep, social thing is you too. can come to my dance club and be a member. I don't ask for what's your education, what's your political background, what's your religion, what's your financial situation. I don't care. I am there for 2 hours in that club and everybody has its own problems in his head. And those 2 hours we together have fun moving in a group of eight, forget about everything and just feel like, okay, this is a place where I've, I can be me. And then I go home. That's you were it. You listening to my presentation today. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, I, I talk to an, a huge variety of different people because of Zoom, right? Because I, I had the opportunity. And what I, what I asked was, how did you manage to keep your um your group going during covid and stuff and there were groups that started zoom sessions and once a week at the time that they normally would dance they all went on zoom and they talked about their week and every month they decided not only were they going to be on the zoom session but they were going all going to wait and have their meal on a break in that hour right and so by the time the group got back from covid everybody knew still knew each other so these were these were groups of friends that had square dancing in common and so those are the groups that are stronger because they have kept that social aspect they they recognize each other's birthdays um via zoom and stuff like that that's friendship to music. They and, and, and so when I was, and just hold on, Mickey, give me a chance. And so one of the reasons I was mentioning the building, because we are a center location. So for us, because we have long distances and there's plenty of other groups that are like that. When we provided building, there were people that later on told us because we had provided the building and we, we offered it to everybody. So it, there wasn't, you know, have to, you know, you had to prove that you had to have a certain financial level or something like that. We offered everybody and we said, if you want to come in early and do some extra shopping and stuff, or in the winter time, you don't want to drive when it's dark or, or you're afraid of getting a flat tire in the middle of the night, come driving back, you guys can stay at our place. And we'll provide you breakfast if that's what you want. And there's people that said they would have quit square dancing if it wasn't for the fact that 
they didn't have to save their money and have to do without other things mm -hmm. by us providing us them a place to sleep they could go come to the jamborees or the monthly dance that's, or whatever that's, that's that's a very important aspect of dancing is that feeling of social inclu inclusivity yes. and that feeling of the, of the sociability that, that we're drawing and we're supporting on each other. Um, there is one thing that we talked about and somebody had mentioned this in, in another session. Yeah, square dancing is great now, or it was great then, but now we've got so many different clubs, so many different activities that people belong to that we just can't compete. I asked a question in that and said, okay, well, what activities are you in? And this person was in about three or four different groups. Where did you hear about them? Oh, well, I belong to this club and they also did this and, and they brought me in. Well, you know what? I very rarely hear a lot of people say, I'm a member of the curling club of the darts league, but I also square dance. Why don't you come to square dancing? It's, it's such a lost opportunity. All these other organizations recruit from other group activity single activities done in a group darts curling axe throwing archery whatever they say oh and they organize oh we're going to have this activity at the darts we're going to go out and we're all going to go bowling one night and a few people might join the bowling league but we don't recruit square dancers from a lot of these activities it's such a missed opportunity yeah just food i wanted thought. to add one thing to yolanda um I started uh, something that pay what you want um, for for dances, and I had one dance, and and I said, okay, this is not there's no entrance fee, you just pay what you want, and in the end, the outcome was more than we had with the entrance fee, yep. because there are people that have a, are in a good situation. And they give and there are people that are in a bad situation and they don't usually they give more in 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 relation to what they have uh, than the others do yeah. but that's one way to do it yes and i find that some of the people who might not financially be able to contribute as much well they might be the ones that are setting the chairs out and making the coffee and Absolutely. those things because they can contribute their time mm -hmm. and a lot a lot of people look at this and I, i've actually had dancers and very very affluent dancers complain that the cost went from eight dollars to ten dollars a night per couple it's too expensive dance we can't expect dancers to do this and yet you go to a movie that's 56 dollars if you go with your partner that's just to get into the movie and to watch the movie and, and have a thing of popcorn or if you go to darts and you want to have a drink or if you go out for you know we no, are you so cannot, unreal we are you so, cannot so compare that unrealistic. No, I know you can't, you can't compare it. Because but... when, when we speak together and I say I was at that movie and the other person cannot say I was at that movie too, that's what makes them pay the money. That's right. It's not, and it's not just they want to see the movie. This, this, this is what, where I'm, I'm going with this is we look at these as comparisons and we say, well, square dancing is so cheap. Where else can you go to have an activity for $10 a night and, and socialize with your friends? And the answer is at your house, at my house, at anybody's house, anywhere you want to go. We got to stop making these types of comparisons and say, here's an activity that you can have fun at individually, as a couple, as a group. If you want to come, give it a try. If you don't like it, you don't have to come back, but give it a try. Now, I that, listen. And, and we my also... job is to make them have fun and give them a venue to have fun. If I'm doing my job right, I'll see them again. Yeah. I listen close to Martin, and I think we have to tell our dancers and callers to go a different approach. We got to tell them whenever they talk with people and with their friends and in their business, whatever, where they meet some people, and they talk about square dance, and you just say, square dance? You don't know square dance? Ah, come on, who are you? So, um, well, we, we also, we also so then have they to have make to it... go, oh, we have to go in square dance to be in and to be hip. Just yes. like we have to go to the movies to see the movie, right? We got to make it what interesting. What kind of car do you drive? Uh, right, uh, yeah. And, but, it's but for wheels and an engine. Jolanda said is that, you know, the dancing and the entertaining is a trigger and it's fun, of course. But what sticks everything together is that we care for each other. Yes. And, and yeah. I think this is an, an, aspect, an aspect we need to put out. Um, 
some more, some less on different um, levels, okay? But I think what, what is, is a group strong is if they care for each other. Yes, and yeah. also that in, we include in, the in single Germany, people. Though, yeah, in Germany, though, it's because at the end of every dance, Mickey buys the Weinberger Schnecken in the beer. Yeah, but but one of the things I've heard lately too is that people have said square dancing is still considered a couple's activity, and so a lot of singles are not are afraid to start. And so in our advertising and stuff, we need to make sure that we include, you know, singles are welcome or some version of that. I have a I have a class going. And there was one gentleman, and uh, I, I wasn't approaching him very well in the beginning. And I thought, who is he? Is he a doctor? You know, it, my mind's going. And, and so now I found out he's a, a doctor in chemistry. And, but he's coming single. So we had our first special dance, and students were invited. And I was on stage. I had my eye on, on the door. And he walked in and, and he walked in with a suit and a tie and his ladies, obviously his wife and daughter uh, came after him dressed up for a ball. And I thought, let's look at this. That's the expectation he had for a special dance. Mm -hmm. And people, people do have expectations for dances. We do square dance in, in normal uh, gyms. I mean, I don't, have, my last uh, bigger event that I went to with ballroom dancing was not in a gym. Yeah. And we, so, we need to actually look at, are we a sport? I don't know. When we, when we talk about dancer expectations, our job as a caller is to meet and exceed the dancer expectation, but always with the focus on dancers having success. But one of the things we fail at too often is very much along the line of what you're saying is we fail to tell the dancers what their expectations can be or what they actually are out of this activity. But we are not uh, talking to the dancers, we're talking to the not yet dancers. That's the difference. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's all these kinds of things. Well, as I said, we've got a few sessions coming up. I've got Bob booked in for uh, the end of February. I've got the next session. I'm going to be talking about the power of two. I believe, and then I'll have a session on teaching tips. That's one, one that I'm actually getting all sorts of comments on from teachers in the academia world when I'm talking about teaching and square dancing, which really surprised me. But um, pass it on. But as I said, with any of these kinds of things, take the time, ingest it, learn it, make the most of it, but make it yours. My opinion is one opinion, and I want to stress that. And my way is not always the right way, and it may not be the right way for you. If it works for me, great. It means I'm doing it right because my dancers are enjoying it. But if I did that at, say, Mickey's dance, it might not work. I have to learn these things to assess the dancers and give the dancers what they want with their expectations so that they can always succeed and be happy with what it is that they're going to get from my product. My ultimate goal, of course, is I want them to come back to me. I don't want to steal them from Mickey. I want to do both Mickey and me. And that way, you know, Mickey's getting more dancers he's getting and he's buying the beer at the end of his dance. Right, Mickey? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm going to, uh, I'll keep the session open if you guys want to carry on with the discussion, but my daughter and new granddaughter are supposed to be coming over. So uh, we'll see if they're going to come over today and uh, we shall call it there for a session. Uh, I can leave the, the room open if you guys want to stay and discuss things. If not, I will I, see you all. I go to bed now. Good night, everybody. And Mal, thank you very much. My pleasure. Yeah. I'll take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Take care. Yeah, November 4, Bye, guys. 2022, 1, 14 p.m.